swine flu virus. Officials from the Centers for Disease Control and other agencies testified in front of two House Energy subcommittees. They also heard from representatives of pharmaceutical companies who talked about the production and distribution of the H1N1 vaccine. The hearing was about four hours. The meeting will come to order. T today we're having a joint hearing of the Health Subcommittee and the Oversight and Investigation Subcommittee. And the hearing is titled H1N1 Preparedness, an Update of Vaccine Production and Distribution. We're going to begin with opening statements from the members of the subcommittees. The chairman and ranking members of the two subcommittees will be recognized first for a five-minute opening statement, followed by five-minute statements by the chairman and ranking member of the full committee and the chairman emeritus. Other members of the subcommittees will then be recognized for two-minute opening statements. And I'm going to begin by recognizing myself. And let me explain that the purpose of this hearing is to get an update from the main stakeholders involved in the manufacturing and distribution of the H1N1 vaccine and to shed some light on where we currently are in the process and what we can expect moving forward. The most recent estimates from the Centers for Disease Control are truly alarming. Over the past six months, it is likely that 22 million people in our country have been infected with the disease and about 98,000 have been hospitalized. To date, it is estimated that 3,900 individuals have lost their lives to H1N1. Unlike regular flu that affects predominantly the elderly population, the vast majority of H1N1 deaths have occurred in people between the ages of 18 to 64. Even more tragically, the CDC estimates that 540 of these deaths have occurred in children. And these numbers are significantly higher than earlier estimates, and as we move further into flu season, we can only expect to see them increase even more. We now know that this virus and vaccine is unlike flu vaccines that we have produced before in that it is extremely difficult to grow. Early estimates on vaccine amounts were based on how vaccines usually behave in the production phases. Unbeknownst to anyone involved in this process, H1N1 proved to be very different. And though the manufacturers have been able to speed the growth of the vaccine by selecting the fastest growing strains, we still are lagging behind where we originally thought we would be with our production numbers. Fortunately, though, this particular vaccine appears to be highly effective in creating an immune response in individuals. And for adults, one small dose of the vaccine will produce enough of a response to protect from H1N1. But, but these early delays in production are now rearing their ugly head as our country watches the disease spread and takes lives while vaccine is still hard to come by. To date, nearly 42 million doses are available for distribution, which is about half of what we originally expected to have by this time. It's no wonder, therefore, that story after story in the papers and on the news highlight the frustration that the American people are facing in trying to get the vaccine that would protect them from the disease. We hear accounts of individuals waiting on lines for hours at clinics. Some cannot find clinics in their neighborhood at all, and areas are still waiting to receive even their first doses of the vaccine. There is a school district in my hometown, for example, that is yet to receive the vaccine, and understandably, the parents are irritated. And this frustration is exacerbated by accounts in the country that seem to have more than enough vaccine, you know, in some areas, while getting this vital production from H1N1 poses no difficulty at all. So we are getting a lot of disparities from one place to the next, and naturally people are confused and they are angry. So that is why myself and Chairman Stupak are holding this hearing today. I, I personally would like to better understand how the production of vaccine is going, when, for example, we will be able to expect enough vaccine so that all individuals who want it can get it, and will this happen before flu season is over. I would also like to understand more about the distribution process. I understand that the states make their own distribution plans and do the ordering for their state through the CDC. But how are these plans created, and how do states make the determination where to start with vaccine distribution and which dis distributors to prioritize? We have a number of very important individuals with us today who have been working around the clock on these issues, and I would like to welcome you all. We appreciate your taking the time to provide us with this update today. Um, we understand how difficult this process has been. You know, we are not here to beat you up, but we are here to try to get some answers, and particularly where we go from here. Um, so with that, I'd like to uh, uh, let me just thank again uh, Bart Stupak, Chairman Stupak, for working with me to put this hearing together. And I, I guess we're going to go to uh, 
Mr. Walden at this point for an opening statement. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for convening this uh, important hearing. H1N1 has been dominating the news and parents and general public's concern for the last couple of months, as we all know. I'm hopeful this joint subcommittee hearing can help answer questions and discuss solutions to the challenges arising from the first flu pandemic in 40 years. As many of you know, I have firsthand experience with H1N1. I think I was probably the first member of Congress to go on record as likely having uh, been by, as being diagnosed as likely having H1N1. I had not been vaccinated because, like the majority of my fellow members of Congress, I don't fall into the CDC's priority groups. And like millions of other people across the country who have had H1N1, I felt rotten for a few days. It's not something you want, and it's not something you want to pass on to others. But I did follow my doctor's advice and the CDC's directions and stayed at home here in D.C. to rest uh, for at least two days after my fever broke, which is what I was told to do. And luckily, I was fortunate and recovered quickly. Others have not been so fortunate. Last week, we learned that approximately 4,000 people, 540 of them children, have died from H1N1. The fact that this flu hit young children so hard and the constant news reports about rising pediatric deaths have scared the daylights out of parents. You see this fear played out in the number of parents lining up with their small children at public vaccination clinics for hours at a time and flooding their pediatrician's offices with phone calls trying to hunt down the vaccine. From the folks I hear from in my district, they can't find the vaccines. Based on statements made by HHS and CDC, parents had counted on being able to vaccinate their children by October or November. Originally, CDC projected 40 million doses would be ready by the end of October. Ultimately, only 23 million doses were available. Instead, parents hear reports every day on the news about rising pediatric deaths and vaccine shortages and delays. Some wait in line for hours, only to be told when they get there there's no vaccine left. Today, I hope we can get some concrete answers about when the vaccine will be available, I also want to hear from HHS and the vaccine manufacturers about the reasons for the delay and what can be done now and in the future. HHS Secretary Sebelius was before the full Energy and Commerce Committee on September 15th, and at that time she testified that by mid-October a, quote, large-scale campaign, close quote, for vaccinations would be underway. She also stated repeatedly that there would be, and I quote, enough vaccine for everyone, close quote. Secretary Sebelius now says the vaccine manufacturers painted an overly rosy picture of their production. Is that the case? Or did the virus seed not perform as expected? I don't think finger pointing exercises are particularly helpful at a time when we're facing one of the biggest public health issues in recent years and a somewhat panicked public. But there have been repercussions, no doubt about it. I also want to learn about how HHS has assisted states and local health departments in preparing for this pandemic. For example, in my district, hospitals are implementing their incident command plans due to emergency rooms being hit with waves of patients with flu-like symptoms. These spikes of patients are coming at a time when doctors, nurses, and hospital staff are either homesick with the flu or taking care of their children that are home from school because of the flu. So we're looking at a situation of increased patient volume and decreased staff capacity. Hospital administrators are monitoring staff levels and patient volumes in some cases on an hourly basis. So if they reach a tipping point, the hospitals can cancel elective surgeries to ensure there's adequate staffing to care for patients in the emergency room and those admitted to the hospital. When I called the 18 hospitals in my district, each one of them asked, where's the vaccine that we were told was coming? So let's get the facts on the table about the reasons for the delay and when HHS knew about it. If there were production issues, how can they be corrected? And if there are communication issues between the manufacturers and HHS and HHS and the public, how they can be fixed so parents are not unnecessarily confused. When the administration promised enough vaccine for everyone, the people want to know that it's coming. I'm very interested to hear from Dr. Lori and uh, both Drs. Lori and, uh, and Dr. Shukat about what direction HHS and CDC have given hospitals and how to prevent this confusion in the future. So I hope this isn't the last hearing we have on this issue. This is the first pandemic in 40 years and the first since Congress began providing funding starting in 2006 for pandemic preparedness. 
And at that time, we were deeply concerned about the possibility of a pandemic spreading a bird flu that could be 40 percent uh, in mortality. Fortunately, this one has not proven to be as deadly. I believe Congress has appropriated $13 billion for this effort. This is an area where we need continued oversight so we can figure out what worked, what didn't, and what we should do going forward. So I am particularly interested in the technologies for vaccine production and whether we can do better in the future. I understand that one of the manufacturers, Metamune, has been able to meet its delivery schedule in part due to the different kind of technology that company uses to make a live attenuated vaccine. Even though Metamune grows the virus in chicken eggs, which is uncertain and unpredictable in yielding a sufficient supply, they have achieved better results. I know that as part of its pandemic preparedness planning, HHS has awarded contracts to companies to look into cell-based vaccine production, as well as other ways to improve yields and production times. So I would like to know about the status of these efforts and whether we are doing enough to ensure that we are prepared for a pandemic influenza. I welcome the witnesses and look forward to discussing these important public, important public health issues with them. Thank you for your testimony. Thanks for the hearing, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Walden. Chairman Stupak. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks for working with me and our O&I staff for putting together this hearing. Look forward to uh, doing this joint hearing today, and I think we have a good hearing lined up. And as you say, we're not here to point fingers, but try to find out how we can do things better in the future. Today, we continue our committee's oversight of the 2009 pandemic H1N1 flu by examining more closely the production and distribution of H1N1 vaccine. This will be the third hearing of the Energy and Commerce Committee as held this year on the H1N1 influenza. According to the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, as of November 13, 2009, influenza activity was widespread in 46 states, almost all which is likely H1N1 influenza. There have been 22 million infections, 9,800 hospitalizations, 3,900 deaths from the H1N1 virus, 540 of which have been confirmed pediatric deaths. This is a conservative figure because not every child who dies from flu-related causes has been diagnosed with the flu. To date, there have been more pediatric deaths from the H1N1 than usually occurs in the entire annual flu season. In September, September Secretary Sebelius testified before the Energy and Commerce Committee, indicating by, that by mid-October, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services would be up and running with vaccines. In fact, CDC had projected that 40 million doses of H1N1 vaccine would be on hand by October 15th but not even 13 million doses had arrived by October 22nd. News reports have indicated that because of shortages in vaccines, doctors were dealing with wor worried and panicked parents who wished to have their children vaccinated while state and local health care departments are experiencing long lines that can produce up to five-hour waits for parents, children, pregnant women, and seniors. There have also been news reports indicating that private businesses, just as J.P. Morgan and Goldman Sachs, have been receiving the vaccines before individuals in the high-risk category. And let's not forget about the report citing military officials saying terrorist suspects being held at Guantanamo Bay would receive the vaccine before most Americans. Like many districts around the country, my own district in northern Michigan has been affected by the H1N1 in a variety of ways. Since the outbreak began, Michigan has had over 500 schools shut down because 25 percent or more of their student bodies were absent with flu-like symptoms. Since September 1st, 1,226 people have been hospitalized in Michigan with flu-like symptoms, a 35 percent increase over last week when 801 cases were reported. The Oversight Investigation Subcommittee, along with the Health Subcommittee, have a responsibility not to merely rely on media accounts, but to get to the bottom of the situation. While we are not here to point fingers at who is to blame for the delay in the production and distribution of vac vaccinations, we do need to shed some light on the process between the government and the manufacturers. Given the urgency of the circumstances and the need for expeditious action, cooperation between drug manufacturers and federal agencies is imperative to ensure that our country is prepared to respond to H1N1 and future pandemics. When the H1N1 virus initially broke out, we knew very little, including how Americans would react to the vaccine and if, and if we would need more than one dose per individual. A vaccine didn't even exist. We did not know how different H1N1 vaccines were from the vaccinations for the seasonal flu. In addition to discussing the specifics of H1N1 vaccine production and distribution, I hope we can shed some light today on our outdated vaccine process. 
It's my understanding that the manufacturing process for the H1N1 vaccine relies on obsolete egg-based influenza vaccine technologies that are subject to certain inherent uncertainties and delays such as incubation periods. As a result, we will continue to face similar challenges in responding to future influenza outbreaks, both outbreaks of novel strains such as the 2009 H1N1 strain and the pandemic or seasonal influenza we face every year. Many experts, including the CDC Director Tom Frieden, have said that it's important to develop new, te to new technologies such as cell-based vaccine production. We will hear from four of the five manufacturers that the U.S. government has contracted with to produce and distribute H1N1 vaccines. These manufacturers will give us an in-depth knowledge of the production challenges that they face and share their thoughts on how we can improve this process as we move forward. Glasgow Smith Klein was not invited to testify at the hearing as their vac vaccination was just recently approved by the FDA. Joining the manufacturers is doc Dr. David Lakey, Commissioner of the Texas Department of State Health Services, who will be the voice of the state health departments across the country, and Dr. Jeffrey Levy, the Executive Director of Trust for America's Health, a nonpartisan organization dedicated to making disease prevention a national priority. I look forward to hearing from all of our witnesses today and delving deeper into the challenges that both the government and industry are facing with the H1N1 pandemic. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you, Chairman Stupak. Uh, gentleman from Kentucky, Mr. Whitfield. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I suspect that every member of this panel has received many phone calls from their district, as I have, complaining about the shortage and wanting some answers and expressing their, their fear for their children and their family members. Uh, as you said, we've had about three hearings on this subject matter. But today, I really, really want to focus from my perspective on really the relationship and the interaction between the federal government, the state government, and the manufacturers and the distribution process. Number two, why have there been production delays specifically? Why? And why has there been difficulty in uh, growing uh, the virus? Is it because of technology? Is it because of process? Is it... Uh, something else. And then third of all, I, I would like to touch on how does the U.S. compare in getting this uh, vaccine out with other countries, and how do our problems compare to those problems? And with that, I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. Uh, full committee chairman, Mr. Waxman. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you and Chairman Stupak for holding this joint subcommittee hearings on the H1N1 uh, 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 virus and how we're responding to it. The reports on H1N1 are sobering. As of last week, 46 states are now battling the disease. CDC estimates that perhaps 22 million people have been infected with H1N1, and as many as 98,000 have been hospitalized, and about 4,000 have died, including 540 children. This is a harsh reminder that we don't need a bioterror attack or other man-made dis disaster to threaten our health and make us worry for our children. In several ways, we have been well prepared. The federal and state governments have been preparing for a pandemic for several years. Our surveillance worked, and we are, were able to catch the H1N1 relatively early in its spread. Federal and state governments have developed and exercised pandemic plans public education has been commendable. There are five safe and effective FDA-approved H1N1 flu vaccines now available, and FDA has the authority for emergency use authorization to allow for unapproved but promising drugs and other products to be used to prevent and treat H1N1 flu. FDA has used this authority to make antivirals, diagnostics, and personal protective gear available in the fight against this flu. But there are clear gaps in our preparedness. We had widespread disease before we had vaccine, and vaccine supplies have been more limited than we had hoped. And at the same time, hospitals and other health care providers have been stretched to capacity. We know that the best way to protect ourselves from the flu, H1N1 or seasonal flu, is to get vaccinated. Because of this, the Obama administration contracted 
to purchase 195 million doses of H1N1 vaccine. They also picked up the full cost to the states for purchasing the vaccine. The hope was that a robust vaccine supply would arrive before infections began to soar and everyone worked as quickly as possible to meet that goal. These hopes were not met. The past several weeks have reminded us that the process of making flu vaccines is unpredictable and challenging. Millions of chicken eggs have to be injected with virus, then the virus has to grow. This lag has caused most, caused most of the delay in producing delivering needed vaccine supplies. There's understandable frustration in the face of a growing number of infections and long lines at vaccination clinics. Parents are understandably concerned about getting their children immunized as quickly as possible. I want to make sure that everyone who needs the vaccine has access to it. At the same time, there have been unprecedented levels of collaboration among federal agencies, the vaccine manufacturers, and the states. And according to experts, the manufacturer's ability to produce a vaccine within six months after identifying the virus is impressive. These efforts, while significant, are not enough for those people who are still seeking immunization. And I look forward to today's testimony so that we can understand where we are in the epidemic and the vaccination effort. We also need to learn how the process can be improved, uh, both in the short term, so that people can be protected from this disease as quickly as possible, and in the long term, so that when we face the next flu pandemic, we can be even better prepared than we have been this year. I thank the witnesses for today. I look forward to their testimony. Yield back my time. Thank you, Chairman Waxman. Next, we have the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Shimkus. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, too, uh, want to uh, mention our, our, our sincere um, prayers for those who have lost um, family and loved ones during, during this illness. And they're throughout the country, and, and I think a lot of districts ha have been uh, affected. Uh, information has been good. And f as far as there's more people washing their hands, there's more people covering their mouths, uh, Greg Walden mentioned staying at home, and I think that that is a thing that information has been very, very helpful. Uh, information has also been harmful, and that's this rush and this fear of people lining up for, um, you know, the uh, injections or the mist sprays, and and we've. So my concern is, we've got to be real about the projection of information to the public because uh, the public is. Uh, will respond appropriately. I think the rosy expectations has really caused this dilemma that we're in. Uh, that, the other thing that I, I, I think we should focus on is this is something that we've had a year, in essence, to prepare for. What if, in our first thoughts about a pandemic after September 11th is, there is something that we cannot prepare for? We do not know what's hit, and how do we ramp up get information out, and then respond, I think that is as critical a question in, in the homeland security terrorist debate as responding to something we can prepare for. So there's a lot of things we can learn from in the hearing today, and I appreciate the first panel and, and the follow-on panel, and I think uh, we'll be very uh, attentive to your testimony, and you'll, I'm, I think there'll be a lot of good questions offered by members, and I yield back my time, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shimkus. Uh, Chairman Dingell. Mr. Chairman, I thank you. And I want to commend you and Chairman Stupak for holding this hearing, which is very important. Since the initial outbreak of March the, of the H1N1 influenza in Mexico, the federal government, state and local public health departments, health providers, vaccine manufacturers, and many others have been working overtime to produce and distribute the H1N1 vaccine and to educate the public on precautions that can be taken to prevent the spread of the influenza. Since April 42, people in Michigan have died since contact, contracting any strain of influenza. More than 12 
hundred have been hospitalized and over 584,000 have reported flu-like symptoms. Across 48 states, there have been 3,900 deaths from H1N1 virus, 9,800 hospitalizations and 22 million infections. The high number of deaths from H1N1, in particular, the high number of pediatric deaths has increased the demand for the vaccine a demand that is unlikely to cease at any time soon. This vaccine first became available in the beginning of October as of, and as of November 5, approximately 35 million doses have become available. This is well below the CDC projection of 40 million doses by the end of October. There is no doubt that manufacturing a vaccine in short order is a difficult task, and this country has had difficulties with flu vaccines before. This task requires scientists to identify the virus correctly, determine the appropriate and most effective method for a vaccine, and then manufacture millions of, of vaccines to be distributed, all with the pressure of completing the task quickly and most importantly, safely. I know that there are many unforeseen roadblocks for manufacturers, whether it be the difficulty in producing the vaccines in an egg-based system a shortage of appropriate egg supply, equipment, and equipment failures, amongst other things else. And while this shortfall is a disappointment, I believe we better serve the American people when we focus on produ producing a safe and effective vaccine and having it made available in a safe and efficient manner. History has taught us that prioritizing speed over safety is short-sighted when it comes to flu outbreaks. In February of 1996, 1976, two recruits at Fort Dix fell six sick from the H1N1 flu strand. Congress responded swiftly. That August, a national influenza program was produced, and one week later was signed into law by President Ford. We were forced to deal with the costly consequences of our actions which ultimately led to great public mistrust of immunizations as the program was mishandled and lives were lost. It is appropriate to respond to the national threats, but we need to remember to be deliberate and thoughtful and wise in our response. The H1N1 outbreak and the distribution of the vaccine provides the federal government with an opportunity and the responsibility to closely examine our pandemic response system for HHS and CDC in particular, this means examining the way in which our government communicates with the public. For FDA, this means examining the methods in which the vaccines are approved. For many of my colleagues and for many of those testifying today, my goal is to ensure the safety and health of the public, while at the same time looking forward to how we can best prepare for future pandemics and how we can learn from the ongoing events of the day. This will include examining the national strategic stockpile and whether it is adequately supplied, preparing our scientists and manufacturers with the most effective and efficient technology to create and produce vaccines, as well as looking to whether or not the Congress has provided adequate funding for HHS, CDC, and FDA to give them the resources needed to carry out their missions. Today, I believe this hearing will be helpful in answering these questions and others. And I look forward very much, Mr. Chairman uh, Pallone and Mr. Chairman Stupak, uh, for working with you and for uh, hearing what our witnesses have to say today as we seek to mitigate the outbreak of H1N1. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Chairman Dingell. Uh, next is a gentleman from Texas, Mr. Burgess. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Like so many other members of Congress, on a Sunday afternoon in April, a football game was interrupted with a notice of a public health emergency about a new kind of flu. Uh, we had a conference call later that day for members of Congress. I don't know how many were actually on the call, but I remember thinking at that time, our greatest danger here is not anticipating how aggressive this virus could be if we are truly faced with a novel influenza for which most of us do not have uh, a pre-existing immunity. And that's 
sort of where we are today. Fortunately, the story is not nearly as bad as it could have been, and many of us feared that it might be. But nonetheless, it, it points up that some of the difficulties that have been encountered. Mr. Chairman, I, I will say uh, I'm grateful that we've had three hearings, but it seems to me when we were preparing for a possible avian flu pandemic in 2004, 2005, and 2006, we had many more hearings for just the preparation for that possible pandemic than we've had after we find ourselves in the, in the throes of, uh, of, of this illness. Now, uh, we do have to ask ourselves, how could we have misanticipated the ability to produce vaccine? We saw this coming, we knew it was coming, we had reports over the summer from the Southern Hemisphere that it wasn't as bad as it could have been, and yet there were some particularly vulnerable populations which would need uh, a, perhaps a, aggressive use of, of, a, of vaccination protocols, and we find ourselves in our district without being able to provide even the vaccinations for those high-risk individuals. Um, in fairness, I do want to say that I've had good cooperation from the, uh, from the CDC, Department of Homeland Security, um, Department of Health and Human Services, who came to my district in August and had a roundtable with school districts in, in my area so that they could be better prepared. Fort Worth Independent School District took a lot of heat last April and May for closing their school district early, but they were frightened of, of, of what, what might happen with not anticipating the severity of this this illness. And then uh, just finally, I do on a personal note, I want to thank Dr. Lakey for being here for the Texas Department of Health. And he has also been good enough to do conference calls with members of the Texas delegation as we worked our way through some of the difficulties with the distributional issues of, of getting the vaccine where it's needed. And, and I will also just thank uh, Dr. Hamburg at the Food and Drug Administration, who was kind enough to take my call after the news reports said that Texas was getting expired Tamiflu to uh, protect its citizens. And this was one of the problems that we encountered in 2005. We produce a lot of antiviral. The, uh, the, the, the illness doesn't materialize. And how, how long is the shelf life? And indeed, there, there were tests done to ensure that that shelf life was longer than what was stamped on the box. It was just an unfortunate public relations aspect that we didn't, uh, we didn't correct that. But I was grateful to Dr. Hamburg for calling me and, and helping me through that particular public relations crisis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the uh, consideration. I'll yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Burgess. Um, gentlewoman from California, Ms. Eshoo. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this uh, important joint hearing on uh, H1N1 preparedness, uh, production, and distribution. Um, uh, I appreciate the witnesses being here today, and I look forward to their testimony. Uh, as we've heard from our constituents uh, or experienced in our own families, H1N1 uh, pandemic has proven to be widespread and really highly contagious. Since the vaccine was first slated for distribution in October, in mid-October, uh, I, along with, uh, I'm sure, um, uh, probably all of my colleagues have received countless calls from constituents asking when they can get the vaccine. Lines of patients have been out the door uh, and around the block, and the news has been filled with stories of empty clinics and angry parents. Well, I don't think there's one source to point to uh, uh, relative to uh, production and distribution problems. I'm interested in looking at the uh, systemic reasons for the somewhat antiquated vaccine process we have today. Uh, for more than a half a century, the United States has been using egg-based technology to create vaccines. While it's safe and effective, um, it's a slow-moving process. Across Europe, uh, vaccine developers are using the faster process of incorporating uh, mammalian cells to grow vaccine. As we begin to explore cell-based technology, uh, I would pose the question, will there be an adequate FDA approval process for these new vaccines? I'm also interested in hearing from the vaccine manufacturers on how they ramped up production, in some cases, to 10 times their normal production schedule. We know that production has been delayed for H1N1, uh, a harmful but relatively moderate uh, virus compared to something more lethal like the Spanish flu. But in the case of a stronger virus with a higher fatality rate, would our country be able to produce enough vaccine for everyone in a short time period? So I look forward to uh, uh, questioning the witnesses, welcome them again, learning more about how we can improve vaccine 
production in our country. And again, thank the uh, chairman for this joint uh, and important hearing. And I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Eshoo. Uh, gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Murphy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As we look at uh, how we are handling this latest crisis in our government, I reflect back on a few years ago when we were faced with the sudden and unanticipated problem of Hurricane Katrina, which led to an unfortunate uh, between 1,300 and 1,800 lives lost from the hurricane and the flood itself. It also resulted in a flood of members of Congress repeatedly and bitterly attacking the administration and anybody else in town because of government's mismanagement of the whole issue. Now, of course, it begs the question, who do we blame this time for where we are? Or should we stop that game and simply get down to the business of understanding we want a painfully candid and brutally honest assessment of what is happening, what has gone right, what has gone wrong, do we have any weaknesses, and what do we need to do about it? I would hope it is this case instead that we use this, her this, this hearing as an opportunity to be honest with each other. We are all deeply concerned of the thousands who have lost lives the thousands who have been hospitalized, and quite frankly, the millions who are worried that they may be affected by this uh, latest virus hitting our nation. We recognize the incredible scientific achievements, and quite frankly, I'd like to compliment the manufacturers for working so hard in trying to develop the vaccinations and the nasal uh, uh, systems uh, for uh, sending out these things to help us uh, deal with this uh, virus. But we still have a long way to go. And we are having this hearing today, quite frankly, because we are concerned. Something is not going right. Was it the, uh, the goals were set too high, too unrealistic? Was it done somehow to assuage the worries of the public, but something we were not ready to do? Or can we really meet those goals? I'm looking forward to hearing from all the witnesses today. We have a very talented panel before us. Um, I'm excited to hear what you have to say. But more than anything else, let's use this as an opportunity to be honest, not political, and really work for some solutions. And I yield back my time. Thank you, uh, gentleman from Texas, Mr. Green. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you for uh, holding this hearing today. Give us an update on H1N1 vaccine production and distribution. Uh, Texas has ordered its full allocation of 3 million doses of the vaccination, but that order has not been filled due to the slow production and supply of the vaccines. I worry that states like Texas, which is the second largest state, is whether they're receiving their fair share of these uh, vaccinations. We are a border state, with, uh, and that comes with a great deal of border issues along with swift transmission of infectious diseases. I welcome Dr. Lakey, who is Commissioner of the Texas Department of State Health Services, who will be testifying on our second panel today. And he assured me that Texas is receiving its fair share of vaccinations and the state is continuing to order the maximum amount. The issue is whether the commitments of production are being met and why they are not. I'd like to highlight a piece of legislation I sponsor along with our our colleague, Representative Tim Murphy, H.R. 2596, the No Child Left Unimmunized Against Influenza Act. The bill would allow HHS to perform a voluntary multi-state demonstration project test the feasibility of using the nation's elementary schools and secondary schools as influenza vaccination centers in coordination with school nurses, uh, school health programs, local health departments, and community health care providers state insurance agencies and private insurers. I'm pleased the bill was included in H.R. 3962, uh, the Affordable Health Care for America Act. It was passed out of the House. Schools are our logical places to vaccinate our children. Parents uh, can opt into the program and, and not have to take time off from work if they're to get their child vaccinated, which in a blue collar district like ours is hard to do. Again, the issue is, is that uh, why haven't the production goals been met that we could fill the requests from the various states? And I want to thank our witnesses to be here, who are here today. And it appears uh, that so we'll know what problems have occurred with H1N1 vaccination production distribution and how we can fix it. And I hope we'll learn from the mistakes and, uh, and hopefully make it much better. I yield back my time. Thank you. Gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Blunt. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you and um, Chairman Stupak for holding this hearing. Um, this is an important topic, obviously, and one we ought to be concerned about. I've been concerned about both the vaccine distribution process 
uh, and frankly, the misleading overestimates of vaccine availability. I, I believe Mr. Waxman, the chairman of the full committee, uh, said in his statement that the administration's hopes were not met. Well, it's uh, apparently hope does not get the job done here. Uh, in addition to their hopes not being met, I think it's outrageous that suspected terrorists at Guantanamo Bay and Wall Street, uh, people who work on Wall Street, uh, were, were apparently slated for access to the vaccine ahead of the people that health care professionals said were in danger. Uh, since October, 43 million vaccines have been made available, but that falls far short of the 159 million people considered to be at high risk of, of, uh, because of these complications. It also falls short of the government's original projection that 120 million vaccines would be available by mid-October. In fact, just last week, the government was still estimating that 8 million vaccines were going to be shipped when only 5 million were released. I don't know how we could be this far into this process and still be 40 percent off uh, in our one-week estimate. So I'll be interested to hear the answers to those questions. In Missouri alone, there have been 60 school closings this year. Since the beginning of the year last year, during the same period, there were none. Uh, since October the 4th, approximately 21,700 people in Missouri have possible cases of H1N1 flu. Uh, during the first six months of last year's flu season, uh, there were 28 cases of all kinds of flu. Uh, and sadly, last week in Missouri, the eighth person died from complications with H1N1. Uh, I want to know, and the people I work for want to know, uh, where this problem fell, met its, uh, uh, its failure to, uh, uh, to understand the problem, to recognize the problem, to moon, move forward with the problem, uh, and with vaccine delivery, how long ago did we know that the vaccines were not going to be available and what could we have done about it? Uh, and Mr. Chairman, I expect some of those questions to be answered today, and I'm grateful to you for holding this uh, hearing. Thank you, Mr. Blunt. Gentleman from um, Pennsylvania, is he there? Mr. Oh, yeah, gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Doyle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, and I want to thank you for holding this hearing on the issue of H1N1 preparedness at such a relevant time. As the Centers for Disease Control has recently reported, uh, the H1N1 strain has now claimed over 4,000 lives since April of this year. Of those, over 500 were children. I'm, I'm very sad to report that just this past week, a newborn baby died at Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh, located in my district, of suspected H1N1 influenza. If confirmed as being an H1, H1N1 death, this will be the first reported infant death. In the state of Pennsylvania alone, 9,600 cases have been reported, nearly 1,800 of them in my congressional district. This is indeed a very serious problem. This pandemic is different than what we're used to dealing with every fall, as the targets uh, an unlikely and unusual population. This strain is mostly affecting younger people, with more than 70 percent of the reported cases in Pennsylvania involving people under the age of 25. Antivirals are playing an increasingly important role in fighting this epidemic, and I'm happy that the FDA has recognized this by issuing emergency use authorization for intravenous administration of these potentially life-saving drugs. I do have serious concerns about the reports of the difficulty doctors have had in obtaining enough vaccines for their patients, and I'm anxious to hear our witnesses testify to this. This year's distribution plan for the vaccine was unprecedented, and I'm extremely interested in the opinions of our panel of its effectiveness. I think that this hearing will serve as an important venue to hear from all sides of this issue and help us all work together so that in the future we know what works and we know what must be improved upon. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses, and I want to thank you all for your testimony today. And again, I want to thank the committee for holding this important briefing, and I yield back. Thank you. The uh, gentlewoman from Tennessee, Ms. Blackburn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want to say thank you uh, to each of you for taking your time uh, to prepare and to come and to be in front of us. Uh, we do appreciate it, and I, I join other members on this panel in extending our sympathies to those who have lost life, 
who have found a serious complication to their health through this process. I bring a perspective of being a grandmother and also a good friend to lots of school teachers uh, that have kept me informed of what is happening on this. I have a, as a grandmom, I have a daughter who has an 18-month-old and a 5-month-old. And I know the mommy blogs have just been filled with the frustration of young mothers trying to get to this vaccine. It has been like playing Where's Waldo? trying to find who has it. Uh, we have done a disservice to these young mothers because you all knew this was coming, appropriate preparations were not made, and these are some of the questions we're going to want to get to today. I want to talk with you about the delays and what you think has caused those. The communications processes, where the breakdowns have been between you all and HHS, because we had different messages that were coming out. That's confusing to the public. I think also the processes that were in place for uh, approval, for distribution, uh, and then certainly looking at the diagnosis, confirmation uh, portion of that. And then let's talk about lessons learned and how we moved forward. And Dr. Shukat, I had pulled a Reuters article, a comment you made in here where you say, I think the key barrier to our immunization effort is really the fragility of the public health infrastructure. I'd love to explore that comment with you. Thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you. A gentlewoman from California, Ms. Harmon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so far, uh, there have been 3,900 deaths in the U.S. Uh, from the H1N1 flu with 266 deaths in California. Uh, this compares favorably. It is less than uh, annual deaths that are expected from uh, uh, the uh, seasonal flu. I suppose that's good news. But I agree with Chairman Waxman that this is our rehearsal for a major terror attack from some sort of biological weapon, and I think our grades are very mixed. In terms of preparing the public, uh, I think we have done very well, and I commend the panel and I commend others in our federal government for making the case uh, calmly and uh, providing lots of details for what the public is supposed to do. I'd give that an A. In terms of preparing the vaccine, we've had a lot of uh, uh, mixed results, and I suppose that could be a B minus. But in terms of distributing the vaccine, I would give us a D minus. And uh, a lot of that is the lack of preparation to states and localities for exactly what they should do with uh, scarce resources. Uh, I was personally scared because I have a pregnant uh, daughter in law who had to spend weeks in New York City. Uh, finding a doctor who had the vaccine. She did get vaccinated. Uh, but in my district, uh, the Beach Cities Health District, one of the first providers uh, able to offer the vaccine, uh, had a drive-in event uh, recently. People drove more than 100 miles from as far as Santa Barbara and San Diego um, turning what was supposed to be a local event into a regional scramble. The line of cars leading to the clinic backed up for miles. Police deployed to manage the unexpected crowds. And all this mayhem was just for 3,000 doses of vaccine. Uh, it was a disaster. And now other areas are not uh, doing the same thing. Uh, as my time expires, uh, the distribution piece was a failure. And I hope our witnesses have learned from this and that we will move forward uh, much more uh, effectively. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Harmon. A gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Gingrey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Today, the Subcommittee on Health and the Subcommittee on Oversight and Investigation will have an important opportunity to shed some light on our government at work and what is a matter of life and death, and hopefully we be able to gain a few answers to the many questions our constituents have asked us about H1N1 preparedness and the Obama administration's response. Mr. Chairman, from Fiscal year 04 to 09, this Congress appropriated almost $7 billion for pandemic flu preparation. Congress also provided an additional $6.4 billion in the FY09 supplemental, bringing the total since uh, fiscal year 04 for pandemic flu preparation to almost $13.4 billion. Without question, the promotion of the public health and safeguarding the lives of all Americans is an important national priority. 
but we also have a solemn duty to thoroughly scrutinize every dime we appropriate because every single dime is one more IOU that will be thrown upon the backs of our children and our grandchildren, likely for dec decades to come. Both the American people's physical health and fiscal health have to be priorities for this Congress. Mr. Chairman, I make this point because I have concerns about this government's response to H1N1, and I believe that it may be a microcosm of what's in store if the health care legislation that this House passed 10 days ago becomes law. When this government prioritizes KSM, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, to receive a vaccine, when this government has enough vaccines for Guantanamo Bay, but not enough for Grandma K, we have a big problem. Is this what the American people expected? Is this what the American people deserve? At the same time, this Congress continues to put them and their children further and further into debt. Mr. Chairman, I think not. I hope that today we'll be able to pull back the curtain for the American people so they can see how the government attempts to manage their health and their collective pocketbook. And I yield back. Thank you. Gentleman from Arkansas, Mr. Ross. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to, to thank the Chairman and Ranking Member for having the Energy and Commerce Committee hold today's hearing on H1N1 preparedness. Uh, over the course of this year, we have seen the strain of influenza spread to a global proportion and lead to a declaration of national emergency. Uh, according to the CDC, as of November 13, 2009, influenza activity was widespread in 48 states, almost all of which is likely H1N1 influenza. Furthermore, there have been 9,800 hospitalizations, 22 million infections, and 3,900 deaths from the H1N1 virus, 540 of which have been confirmed pediatric deaths. Both public and private sectors have attempted to work together in an expedited effort to ensure adequate vaccine production and delivery to patients. Unfortunately, such efforts have fallen short. We have seen major delays in access to this much-needed vaccine. As a result, we have thousands of individuals, including those in high-risk categories, still waiting for the vaccine as we fight this pandemic. I'm also deeply concerned about the impact of H1N1 on our children and our schools. During seasonal flu outbreaks, 95 percent of deaths are usually among those older than 65, but for the swine flu, 95 percent of the deaths are occurring in those younger than 65. And typically among those far younger than that. My concern is that every parent who wants to get their child vaccinated should have the opportunity to do so. The delays in getting the vaccine to the American people must be addressed and fixed now. Clearly, there are problems with the current process in place that could have been prevented. The public deserves answers as to why there is such a shortage in supply of a vaccine when H1N1 has posed such a serious health threat for months. I look forward to hearing answers to this and other related questions. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. Gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Pitts. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, uh, Chairman Stupak, for convening this joint hearing. I'm sure that all of us have received phone calls and emails from anxious parents wondering if they will be able to obtain the H1N1 vaccine for their children. I'm sure we've all been stopped by constituents back home wondering when the vaccine will be available in their area and worried that there is a shortage. Today we will hear from the government departments and agencies tasked with responding to the H1N1 pandemic and from the manufacturers of the vaccine itself to determine how much vaccine has been produced and how much more is on the way and how it is being distributed and allocated. I also anticipate that we will hear suggestions for how production and distribution could occur more smoothly in the future. On our second panel, I would like to specifically wel welcome Phil Hosbach, Associate Vice President of Immunization Policy and Government Relations, the head of the Santa Fe Pasteur's Global Influenza Pandemic Crisis Team, the U.S. Headquarters for Santa Fe Pasteur's in my home state of Pennsylvania. The Pennsylvania site is also the only domestic manufacturing site of injectable flu vaccine and the employees there have been working around the clock to produce both seasonal and H1N1 influenza vaccines. I would also like to welcome Paul Peralt, president of CSL Biotherapies, which has its headquarters in King of Prussia, Pennsylvania, right outside my district. Mr. Chairman, 
Again, I thank you. I look forward to hearing the testimony of all of our witnesses, and I yield back my time. Thank you. The uh, gentlewoman from uh, Wisconsin, Ms. Baldwin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this uh, very important hearing. Um, I want to highlight three issues that I hope our witnesses will address according to their expertise during our hearing uh, this morning. Um, clearly, a thorough response to any public health emergency, such as a flu epidemic, requires a partnership between local, state, and federal public health agencies and labs. And I'm concerned about resource shortages at the state and local level, particularly with regard to uh, personnel and um, modern information technology and communications. Um, I have a bill on that matter and, and would like to hear your insights on how those resource shortages have affected um, our response to this uh, uh, flu um, H1N1. Um, secondly, I'd like an update on the state of innovations and improvements uh, that many of my colleagues have referenced um, that help us do, will help us do a better job next time. Cell-based manufacturing technologies, the use of adjuvants, and um, alternative methods of vaccine delivery uh, beyond uh, injection or, or nasal sprays. And lastly, and I think most importantly uh, to me, um, I'd like the um, witnesses' comments on um, our lack of uh, domestic manufacturing of uh, H1N1 and seasonal flu vaccine. This is of great concern to me, and I asked this of our Secretary of Health and Human Services when she last appeared before the committee. Um, it appears that we have five contracts with five manufacturers for H1N1 vaccine. Only one does its bulk manufacturing in the United States in the state of Pennsylvania. I think that if we were to ever face a um, much greater uh, a flu that presents much greater virulence, um, we would it would be a question mark whether we would be able to uh, uh, get supplies of vaccine from uh, production sites in other countries. Uh, any country would, that hosts uh, vac vaccine manufacturers would <coughs> want to assure that their own population was protected uh, first before permitting the export. And so I'm very concerned about the lack of, of domestic manufacturing presence and would like your comments on that. I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Sullivan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Thank you for holding this joint hearing today on the national H1N1 swine flu preparations, especially on the current status of the vaccine production and distribution. I'm interested today in examining the lessons learned from both the administration and vaccine manufacturers in terms of responding to this national public health emergency. To date, manufacturers have delivered 48.5 million, million doses of H1N1 vaccine and the Department of Health and Human Services has hoped to, that, to have as many as 120 million doses by now. Obviously, there is a large gap between the administration, what the administration had promised and what they were able to coordinate and deliver. I'm concerned that the administration's plan was overly optimistic and that this has led to confusion with the American public. Since September 1, 890 Oklahomans have been hospitalized due to complications from influenza, and 27 persons have died. 90% of the H1N1 related deaths have been persons less than 65 years old. Health officials in my state announced yesterday that all Oklahomans who want to reduce the risk of H1N1 infection are now eligible to receive H1N1 influenza vaccine. While vaccine supplies are limited, demand from priority groups has dipped to a point where all Oklahomans can begin to receive vaccine. H1N1 influenza activity has been widespread in Oklahoma since early September, and even, even throughout, though statewide monitoring has, has recently shown a decline in influenza-linked hospitalizations, this virus is expected to circulate throughout the winter months. The possibility also exists that another surge of H1N1 flu may follow the current one, and we need to be prepared for this contingency. I look forward to hearing the testimony of our witnesses today and examining how we can continue responding to this public health emergency. And I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. The um, gentlewoman from Florida, Ms. Castor. Well, thank you, Chairman Pallone, and good morning uh, to our witnesses. <clears throat> Uh, the CDC and Secretary Sebelius and all of you have done uh, exceptionally well in your public health outreach. Uh, you have kept Americans informed 
about the risk and basic prevention methods to combat the spread of the virus, uh, such as hand washing and the use of alcohol-based sanitizers. And I appreciate uh, Secretary Sebelius's visit to Florida last week. Uh, she visited the East Manatee Family Health Care Center in Bradenton, Florida, <clears throat> and we met personally with representatives from the health department, uh, community health centers, and other providers throughout the area to review local distribution of the vaccine, particularly to people in the high-risk categories like pregnant women and young children and others with uh, asthma and diabetes. Uh, my greatest concern right now is the spread of misinformation, especially on the Internet. Uh, just over the, the past weekend, I was talking with a doctor who I know who's also, he works in Tampa General Hospital. Uh, he's married to an OBGYN, and they were explaining to me that they're running into the problem of, uh, of pregnant women and other in high-risk categories that have read something on the Internet that has discouraged them from receiving the vaccine. And after, I, after talking with them, I went online to see what is out there, and they're right. There's a lot of misinformation on the Internet. Uh, one website calls it a complete load of nonsense that mainstream media and, and American public health officials uh, state that the benefits of H1N1 vaccine far outweigh the risks. They're frightening pregnant women uh, who are at high risk to, to think that they might miscarry if they're vaccinated. Uh, this website reports that the vaccine is responsible for death, paralysis, seizures, and other ailments. So we've got our work cut out for us. It, but it doesn't stop there. In September, a major cable news network did a segment with a so-called infectious disease expert advising parents not to vaccinate their children and declared that he would not vaccinate his own children, claiming that the vaccine and others are not safe and they cause more serious uh, devastating conditions. So in your testimony, will you please address how we can effectively combat the spread of misinformation uh, and continue to empower communities with accurate information and continue to encourage those, especially in the high-risk categories, to receive the uh, vaccination? Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. A gentlewoman from uh, Illinois, Ms. Schakowsky. Thank you, uh, Chairman Pallone and, and Stupak. I wanted to put on the record the uh, effective manner in which my state of Illinois is handling the H1N1 flu vaccine and administration. The Illinois Department of Public Health has an H1N1 specific website that contains a wealth of information about vaccine availability and prevention information. The City of Chicago set up six free clinics to administer H1N1 vaccines at city colleges. Chicago vaccinated nearly 51,000 people in the seven days following the opening of the free clinics. But there are a, a number of issues surrounding the infection and death rates in Illinois that lack sufficient explanation. Maybe you have these answers. Why is the highest number of H1N1 deaths among adults aged 25 to 29? These numbers defy all the things that we previously knew about flu viruses. Do we have the correct distribution system? Is giving the vaccine to banks and companies like Goldman Sachs and NBC the best way to distribute the vaccine? Um, our current lack of research data limits our ability to, to draw concrete conclusions. And if we're unable to draw conclusions, there's no way we could construct an adequate or effective response plan, which only increases all of our risk. Um, so I hope to hear about the public health plans and research efforts underway to help us better understand the disease and innovation prevention and treatment methods that are emerging. I thank all of the witnesses for being here today to help shed more light on the situation, particularly as we're learning new information every day, and I look forward to your testimony. I'll yield back. Thank you. The gentleman from Utah, Mr. Matheson. Well, I want to thank both Chairman Stubeck and Plone for holding this hearing today. My, my state is not unlike my colleagues here on the committee. We've had our outbreaks of H1N1 in schools and communities. We've seen over 623 hospitalizations due to the influenza this year, as well as 14 deaths. Our state has worked with the federal government and manufacturers to make as many vaccines available as possible to our residents, and I'm looking forward to hearing how we can better improve our strategy and coordination for responding to this public health crisis. To date, 
My state of Utah has received a total of just over 296,000 doses, and providers have reported having administered just over 176,000 doses of the vaccine as of November 7th. While our state supply of vaccine continues to arrive in weekly shipments, the vaccine is still in limited supply. I represent the state with the youngest population in the country, so I con continue to be worried about making sure our children get access to this vaccine in a timely fashion. I'm also concerned by several recent reports in the uptick of counterfeit medications. U.S. Food and Drug Administration has issued warnings to consumers to use extreme care when purchasing any products over the Internet that claim to diagnose, prevent, treat, or cure the H1N1 influenza virus. The agency issued this warning after the FDA recently purchased and analyzed several products represented online as Tamiflu. The FDA notes on its website that one of the orders, which arrived in an unmarked envelope with a postmark from India, consisted of unlabeled white tablets taped between two pieces of paper. When analyzed by the FDA, the tablets were found to contain talc and acetaminophen, but none of the active ingredient. I'm working on legislation to proactively address the rise in counterfeit medications with my colleague, Mr. Booyer. Counterfeiting is a lucrative business, and I hope that my colleagues will proactively work with me to address this issue with any drug safety legislation to come before this committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. A uh, gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Space. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for conducting this important hearing. Um, we've heard uh, today already a couple of allusions to uh, Guantanamo Bay and I think one to even Katrina. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm as concerned as anybody about the, the specter of uh, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed uh, getting this vaccine before my son. And I, I guess I'd like your assessment as to whether that is in fact happening. Uh, but more importantly, I think it's important that we understand what we can do uh, as a legislative body at this point to enhance our ability to uh, manufacture and distribute the vaccine in a better way. We've uh, obviously seen far too many deaths across the country, certainly Ohio, and my congressional district has been no exception to that. And I'd also be interesting, er, interested in hearing your uh, opinions concern, concerning other ways that we can uh, combat this, uh, this uh, H1N1 epidemic, uh, apart from administering the vaccine. Uh, my uh, colleague from Florida referenced the misinformation campaign that uh, seems to be uh, occurring out there. I'm curious as to uh, the educational uh, component that that we can promote you know, simple things like uh, hand washing and um, things that our uh, constituents can do to put themselves at a, in a better position. And finally, uh, your assessment as to those who are most likely to get sick and die if they contract the virus, uh, what they can do in particular, diabetes, uh, I understand that the obese uh, have a particular risk factor, um, and how we can again, from a legislative perspective, at this point in time, do everything we can to maximize our ability to combat this uh, troubling uh, epidemic. And thank you, and I yield back my time. Thank you. The gentlewoman from Ohio, Ms. Uh, Sutton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate you holding this hearing today. Uh, so much has changed since uh, this committee held its first hearing on H1N1 back in April. At that time, the H1N1 flu was just breaking, and there were only 91 confirmed cases in the U.S., including a young boy in my district. Um, there was also no vaccine, and the government was just beginning to formulate a federal response to the growing pandemic, so we have traveled some distance since then. Now, nearly eight months later, uh, over 22 million Americans have had the H1N1 flu, and there's a vaccine in production, as we all know, and it's being distributed free of charge to the American people. However, there have been challenges along the way, and we've heard that discussed here today, with manufacturing and distribution of the vaccine. And because of the slow rate of vaccine production, demand has outpaced supply, and the vaccine remains difficult for people to obtain. It's difficult even for those in high-risk populations sometimes. So it's very important that we have this hearing and we figure out ways to address these challenges that we're facing currently and the ones that may be ahead. You know, we've seen moms with young children and pregnant women and the elderly standing in lines, and 
uh, hoping to get the vaccine, and, and we want them to get it. We've heard the reports of Wall Street employees having access to the vaccine, and, um, and it certainly undercut the public's confidence in the distribution process, which is important. Um, and it's important that we correct the record so that people understand what is and isn't happening. But it's also just critically important that we do everything we can to effectively deal with H1N1 um, from this point forward. And frankly, uh, this won't be the last flu challenge that we have so that we can formulate um, uh, the, the proper way to, to respond uh, to these kinds of challenges in the future. I yield back. Thank you. The uh, gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Boyer. Pass. Gentlewoman from uh, Colorado, Ms. DeGette. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank both of our chairmen for having this hearing today. Uh, I'll submit my statement for the record because I'm sure Every single thing I had in there has been said by other members of the committee. But let me just say this. The Oversight and Investigations Committee has had a number of hearings over the years on um, flu pandemics. The good news about what has happened with this pandemic is our public, um, our public campaign, our awareness has been terrific, as Congresswoman Harmon said. The problem is we still do not have an alternative to the egg-based vaccines. And we were, we were assured at the September 15th hearing that we had that we were ramping up production, we knew H1N1 was coming, and those vaccines would be readily available very, very soon. That obviously has been the big problem with our response to this pandemic. Now, it's not so bad because, as it's turned out, this particular strain while fatal and we feel badly about the fatalities that we've had, is not as virulent as, say, the avian flu. But I'll tell you what, if this had been a virulent flu strain like the avian flu, we would have millions of casualties already. Now, my own daughter, who's a type 1 diabetic, spent weeks going around Denver trying to get a vaccine, only to finally get it last week. And, and I've got to say, over the 13 years I've been on this committee, we have got to fix this problem. We can't wait till we have the next pandemic to say that we've got to get an alternative to egg-based vaccines. And so again, uh, to both of our chairmen, I want to thank you for having this hearing. And I want to say that at least this member of Congress intends to keep pushing, even when this is out of the headlines, to make sure we find these alternatives. Because if we don't, it's It'll be on our shoulders the next time we have a pandemic, and it's a virulent pandemic that causes millions of deaths. So, so I intend to do everything I can to make sure that that will not happen the next time. I thank the gentlewoman. Next is the gentleman from um, Connecticut, Mr. Murphy. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, to uh, Chairman Plum Stupak, I appreciate this uh, hearing today. Uh, I appreciate it especially uh, as a parent uh, of a uh, current 15 month old H1N1 patient uh, at home. Uh, he's, uh, he's doing fine, um, uh, but uh, I'm uh, looking forward to uh, the testimony today uh, for a number of reasons. Um, one, I think that uh, this conversation about how uh, our federal government is interacting with state governments is important. And I know you're going to spend some time talking uh, about how you turn your recommendations for distribution systems into best practices. Um, but I'd also like to hear about uh, your uh, uh, interactions with states regarding preventative measures. Um, we've had a number of long-term school closures uh, in Connecticut uh, due to outbreaks. And um, I think one of the difficult things for local school districts has been um, uh, an inability to really get uh, the best information regarding how they should approach uh, small or uh, larger sized outbreaks uh, in school systems, in daycare settings. Uh, and so I think a lot of us would be interested in hearing about uh, how 
how you're disseminating uh, those recommendations down uh, to school districts and to other settings in which you have a lot of kids. Um, and second, uh, just to partner um, and build on the remarks of Representative Baldwin and Representative DeGette, uh, I think a lot of us are uh, very interested uh, in the progress we're making this season, but also for next season on alternative processes. Uh, I know that um, HHS has already given out some uh, fairly large um, research grants um, to uh, companies, one actually located in my district, Protein Sciences, to start building uh, some uh, non-egg-based um, um, processes uh, that have, I think, some real, um, some real potential. And I'm interested in whether you think any of those processes might come online this season or whether we're looking out into uh, the next outbreak or to the next season for some of these alternative processes, um, but again, uh, I, I think there are a lot of I think there are a lot of questions. But I think that you've answered many of them so far. I think you've done a great job in disseminating information, getting information out to the public, and I think that uh, this hearing can just help you build on that. I yield back. Gentlewoman from the Virgin Islands, Ms. Christensen. The gentlewoman passes. The uh, gentleman from New York, Mr. Ween. Oh, her mic is not working. I'm sorry. Is this one working? Yeah, okay. thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. And thank all the chairs and ranking members for having this hearing. As a physician and a former public health administrator, you can imagine that this issue of, is of great concern. And as someone who's managed uh, emergencies in the past, I know how important communication is and managing them and controlling panic and controlling the spread of the disease in this case. Um, uh, since the spring, when we were first made aware of the, f the H1N1, it's now widespread, I think, in 48 states and at least two territories. As of the last report, there are 80 cases in the Virgin Islands. I'm sure there are more now, one death, and 444 cases with 34 deaths in Puerto Rico. And I'm very concerned that half of the children that died from H1N1 uh, between April and August were African American and Hispanic children, which is considerably more than the percentage that both groups represent in the population. So I'd like to hear something of, of what is being done to outreach to those communities, as I have asked before. Um, I want to say that several years ago I introduced the Rapid Cures Act, which would increase research to shorten the time from bug to drug and vaccine. Um, I didn't introduce it in this Congress because I was assured that the research was being done and I thought we'd be further along. But the shortage um, shows that we're probably not and I'm hoping also that we'll, that this, the limitations that we've faced in providing adequate vaccine will um, yield valuable lessons going forward and I look forward to the testimony of our witnesses. Thank you. Mr. Weiner. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I want to thank the, the members of the panel both for their work and for being here today. I represent uh, the community around St. Francis Prep, which represents, I guess, the closest thing to the American ground zero for this virus. You know, frankly, we have, th this is the problem of trying to deal with a complicated health thing in the context of 24-hour news and a lot of people who look at this through the lens of their own experience. We have swung wildly from pole to pole between this is an enormous problem that is going to smite us all to this is not that big a deal. We have the very same people who have been traveling the country saying get government out of our health care are now saying how come government isn't doing a better job with our health care. I certainly hope that you've had a strong and stern talking to to those viruses that refuse to grow fast enough. I hope that any of those viruses that haven't been performing have been summarily dismissed. And I look forward to an oversight report by the GAO about how it is that we're recruiting virus that does such a poor job of growing in chicken eggs when we ask it to. But the bottom line of all of this is to some degree we've all participated in a small way to dealing with this notion of frenzy around this. Even the Vice President of the United States I think probably regrets saying he would recommend his family members not get on a subway in New York City. Um, well, you can catch things, but I'm not sure swine flu is going to be at the top of your list. The point is that we, to some degree in government, 
we too exaggerate our ability sometimes to be able to be a, a fulcrum against mother nature and the laws of medicine and some degree chemistry and physics and the like. And I think that you should be commended for trying to keep a level conversation tone here even in the face of many different cross currents. Um, we should try to learn each time we have one of these instances what we can do better. And I think to some degree a lot of what you've done now is based on lessons that have been learned. But I think that it's also important that we as the legislative branch empower you all to do the job you can and then do our best to give you the elbow room to try to make smart medical decisions in what is a, an environment that is often hypertense, hypersensitive, and often polluted with a lot of misinformation. So I appreciate your being here uh, to help us do that. Thank you. The gentleman uh, from Georgia, Mr. Barrow. I thank the chairman and with, and with um, uh, my thanks to the witnesses for their participation, their work, and the testimony. I'll waive an opening. Gentleman from Iowa, Mr. Brayling. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It has been uh, a long time since the word smite has been uttered in this hearing room. Uh, and unlike my youthful colleague from Connecticut, my three children are in another high risk category college students. But I'm very concerned about the delay in productions of vaccine and the shortages of both the H1N1 and the seasonal flu vaccine and the process of vaccine distribution. There have been severe shortages in my state of Iowa, which, by the way, is the number one egg production state in the country. And I'd like to speak out on behalf of all eggs who've been criticized. Um, <laughs> Vaccine shortages that led to the cancellation of flu shot clinics in my state left thousands of Iowans without access to the flu vaccine and left them vulnerable to the virus. And as of last Friday, the Iowa Department of Public Health had confirmed 19 H1N1 related deaths in Iowa, including one child and 18 adults. And those victims include people from Dubuque and Black Hawk counties, both of which are in my district and more than 500 Iowans have been hospitalized with the H1N1 virus. That's why you can imagine how outraged I was to learn a couple of weeks ago that some of the biggest companies in New York, my apologies, Mr. Weiner, including Goldman Sachs, Citigroup, J.P. Morgan Chase, and Time Warner were receiving large doses of this vaccine for their employees. I don't think that it's appropriate or fair that big Wall Street firms be given priority access to the vaccine while thousands of Iowans are going without it. I sent a letter on November 5th to Secretary Sebelius expressing my serious concerns about the distribution process and urging her to ensure that the, that the vaccine is distributed based on risk and need, not based on wealth or profession or zip code. I haven't received a response to my letter, so I hope that you folks today can shed some light on this process, what additional corrective measures, if any, have been taken, and explain to me and my constituents why these companies were receiving the vaccine when so many of my constituents were forced to go without. And I'm talking about seniors, immunocompromised individuals, and children. I look forward to hearing the testimony of the witnesses today and learning why the Iowans that I represent who would like to receive these vaccines and would like to receive them soon will receive access and what is being done to promote expansion of the availability of the virus. So thank you. Gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Sarbanes. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll be very brief. We're looking forward to your um, testimony. Um, I'll be curious to hear you describe um, where things have gone compared to where you thought they would be the last time we had a hearing, sort of at the beginning of this process, you, you made projections, you talked about certain contingencies, and I'd be interested to know how the advance of the disease has panned out against those original projections because it helps us, it helps us uh, make judgments of, uh, as, as you project further. Um, and, and that would be both with respect to advance of the disease and with respect to the way we're responding to it. Um, and I, I just want to echo um, what Congressman Braley just said, and that is if, if there are going to be delays 
in the distribution. And if, the, if, if what's been manufactured is less than what we hope to have at our disposal at this point in time, it becomes even more critical. I mean, it's always critical that the distribution be done in a fair way, but it becomes even more critical that it be done fairly because the larger context is that there are shortages and it makes people, I think, much more resentful, and rightly so, when they, when they see an unequal distribution and one that's not occurring um, according to the criteria that you've, you've laid out. So I think there's probably a lot of interest in having you address that in your, in your testimony. And I yield back my time. Thank you, Mr. Sarbanes. Um, Mr. Engel. Well, thank you uh, very much, Mr. Chairman, and I, I too will be brief. I'm uh, delighted that we are uh, holding uh, this hearing this morning, and I look forward to listening to the witnesses. Um, uh, obviously, uh, what's going on with the, with the swine flu is, is something that um, Americans are asking uh, lots and lots of questions. We're hearing that um, this is uh, uh, something that is uh, easily spread, and uh, yet uh, we were told uh, several months ago that there would be adequate uh, vaccines, uh, and there aren't. And I know uh, people have been contacting my office to, to find out where they can get vaccines. And I, I think what happened here is that people's expectations uh, were, were rising when the government announced that uh, there would be no problem and people would have uh, enough vaccines uh, for use. Um, I think if that had not been stated or said, uh, perhaps people's expectations wouldn't be so high, but the, the double whammy of not having enough uh, vaccines plus uh, the announcement that there would be enough for people has made people, ha have made people think that uh, something is, is terribly wrong. Um, I've had some discussions with uh, some of the people testifying today, and uh, they have um, helped me to understand what's happened, but uh, I think that we really need to ensure that something like this uh, really never happens uh, again. Uh, I, I know that uh, uh, people uh, in my district have been wondering. My, my staff director had his two little boys just uh, last week, both come down uh, with swine flu, and uh, people have been calling my office and wanting to know uh, where they can get uh, vaccinated, and we've been trying to help them be the best we can, but people are confused and angry at the same time. So I, I look forward uh, to the testimony and to hear uh, what the witnesses have to say, and I, I thank you, Mr. Chairman, for, for holding this very important hearing, and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Engel. I believe um, we've concluded our opening statements, so we'll now proceed um, to the witnesses. Let me call um, or introduce the, the first panel. Starting with my left is Dr. Ann Shuckett, I hope I'm pronouncing it right, who's director of the National Center for Immunization and Respiratory Diseases at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And then we have Dr. Nicole Lurie, who is the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response at the Department of Health and Human Services. And finally, Dr. Jesse Goodman, who is Chief Scientist and Deputy Commissioner for Science and Public Health for the Food and Drug Administration. Now, in accordance with the policy of the Oversight and Investigation Subcommittee, I have not done this before, but because of the policy of the Oversight and Investigation Subcommittee, all testimony at today's hearing uh, will be taken under oath. And I am to advise you that you have the right under the rules of the House to be advised by counsel during your testimony. And I have to ask you initially if you wish to be represented by counsel, and if so, um, you would have to state their counsel's name. Um, Dr. Shuckett? Um, no, thank you. No. Dr. Lurie? No, thank you. You said no. And Dr. Goodman? No. Okay. So then we're going to stand. Each of you should stand. We're going to take an oath. Well, you're going to take an oath, I should say. <laughs> <laughs> you raise your right hand to take the oath. You swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Let the record reflect that the witnesses replied in the affirmative. You are now under oath. Thank you. And we'll start um, with the opening, five-minute opening statement from Dr. Shuckett. I think you all know that you can submit a longer statement for inclusion in the record but we'd like you to try to stick to the five. Thank you. Um, 
thank you, Chairman Pallone and um, Stupak, Ranking Member Walden, and uh, members of the subcommittee. I'm really pleased to be back to talk with the committee about our comprehensive response to the H1N1 pandemic and to answer your questions. Uh, a brief update on the situation. As you've heard, we released new estimates for the toll the virus has taken in the first six months of the pandemic, Something. 22 million infected or ill, um, 98,000 hospitalized, and sadly, almost 4,000 deaths. Um, the virus is spreading in uh, considered widespread in 46 states. In many areas, it is beginning to decrease the burden of illness, but in some, it is still on the upswing. There's been no change in the illness pattern, still disproportionately a younger person's disease, many people with underlying conditions or pregnancy disproportionately affected with severe complications. So far, no change in the virus. It hasn't become more virulent or changed genetically. We still think the vaccine is an excellent match with this virus that's circulating. But unfortunately, the trajectory that the virus will have is unpredictable. We do not know how long this wave will last, whether there will be multiple waves. We know that flu season can last until May, usually. We don't know how much seasonal flu strains will have. Many unknowns, and that makes it even more important that we strengthen our response. Without the investments of Congress in preparedness and strengthening our ability to cope with a pandemic, we would be in much worse shape than we are today. Um, we, I'll go through CDC's response and others will talk more broadly. We rapidly identified and characterized the virus. We developed candidate vaccine strains. We carried out epidemiologic and laboratory surveillance in the U.S. and abroad to understand what was going on and direct our interventions. Our aggressive response has been science-based. We have de rapidly deployed life-saving antiviral medicines and other materiel from our strategic national stockpile. Laboratory kits were prepared in record time and disseminated to all of the public health labs here in the U.S. and to 150 other countries. We deployed field teams to support the state and local response and continue to support the state and locals in what is very much an implementation effort at the front lines. We've issued science-based guidelines on prevention and mitigation. We expected disease to increase this fall before vaccine was available, so we worked very actively with other sectors to make the best use of antiviral medicines in high-risk people or in severe illness, to work with education on ways to better intervene in schools without as disruptive um, effects as we saw last spring. We've focused on businesses and healthcare workers and so forth. Communication has been a priority for all of us, and we've done outreach with new media and old media and many partners. Of course, the heart of our response is the vaccination effort right now. It's been unprecedented in its speed with which we've gotten this vaccine. But of course, like everyone, I'm disappointed in the initial production, and we've been held captive really to this slow-growing virus. However, today I can announce that there are 49.9 million doses of H1N1 vaccine that are available for the states to order. It's not as much as we wanted to have by now or, frankly, what we needed to have by now, but every dose that's coming out is being rapidly moved to places where it can go into people and, be, um, pr and help protect them. At CDC, we worked to develop recommendations to prioritize the use of scarce vaccine for those at highest risk of disease or most likely to spread. We um, have a distribution system that gives each state a pro rata population-based share of the vaccine, trying to have as fair a process as possible. The states and local health authorities are the implementers. They are deciding where that vaccine gets shipped. They are working very closely with the provider community, the local health departments, hospitals, with um, community health centers, with others, uh, schools, for instance, where vaccination efforts can go forward rapidly. 34 states so far have initiated school-located vaccination efforts to really reach large numbers of children promptly. Not as many have been able to be completed because of the supply, but more are happening every day. And we know that the state of Maine expects to finish their school-located program by the end of this week. Um, we have done all this mindful that the environment we live in makes communication and emphasis on the safety of vaccines um, for the forefront for many. And so we've done this without cutting any corners on safety and have strengthened our safety monitoring system to address any unanticipated problems. We're working hard with partners across government and in particular with the state, local and tribal authorities who are 
directing the program where they are. They have been working tirelessly to make this succeed, and I'm happy to detail some of the efforts they've been making in the, in the comment period. When we have the opportunity to look back on this public health challenge, we'll have time to reflect on the remarkable scientific accomplishments that made it possible to rapidly detect and track a previously unseen virus and get a vaccine developed in record time. We'll have time to more systematically search for lessons in production and delivery that we can apply in a future pandemic and to rebuild the public health system that we all rely on. But today, we need to quickly adapt from our recent experience and maintain our focus on the days, weeks, and months just ahead. We will have more vaccine to put in the path of this virus, and it is our commitment to continue to work closely with our state and local public health partners to ensure that it is as effectively delivered to those who need it most. I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, Dr. Shuka. Dr. Lurie? Thank you. I, too, am very pleased to be able to talk with you today about our pandemic response. Maybe put that mic a little closer to you there. Or, Is it better? Yeah, and talk first, into it directly if you, you can. for your foresight and helping to rebuild our country's vaccine infrastructure. As a result, when we decided to pursue vaccine for the H1N1 this spring, we had pre-existing contracts with manufacturers already licensed in the U.S. to get us out of the blocks quickly to contract for manufacturing vaccine and preparedness efforts have helped hospitals and healthcare systems also be ready. My office has a fourfold response related to this pandemic. First, to coordinate a cross-department response and work with the interagency. Secondly, to stimulate the development of and contract with for vaccines and antivirals. Third, to monitor and ensure that we can backstop states and communities if they get overwhelmed and request our help. And finally, to stay prepared for any other emergency, not to take our eye off the ball. This whole response has been a public-private partnership from the get-go. Starting with vaccines, as you know, we developed a new vaccine with unprecedented speed, and this was really made possible by investments in basic and clinical science, manufacturing, regulatory processes, and would not have been possible at all without our partnerships with industry. And while modest amounts of vaccine came ahead of schedule, as the graphic over here details on the left, a combination of poor production yields late completion of seasonal vaccine, problems with new filling lines, decisions in the home country of one manufacturer, caused delays in the availability of vaccine, not just for the U.S., but around the world. And while the number of doses that's been produced and distributed and administers continued to grow, we remain vigilant. To ensure a steady supply of vaccines, we talk with manufacturers almost every single day. We constantly monitor the progress of every lot produced, working to make up ground wherever possible. And right now, we have full-time staff in the facilities of two of the manufacturers. In addition, Secretary Sebelius and I have spoken directly with CEOs, actually on several occasions, seeking to identify opportunities to work together to be sure that there are no arcane kinds of obstacles in the way. And while these delays are really frustrating to everyone, we do need to remember that the virus is the real enemy here. And the way forward, as we've been talking about this morning, is to improve our country's domestic manufacturing capacity using newer, faster, and more predictable technologies so that the virus of the future does not defeat us. Antivirals have been another critical aspect of our response, and I just want to point out that we've supported the development of new antivirals, issuing the first emergency use authorization for an intravenous antiviral, and we have procured uh, over 30,000 do uh, 30, doses across three types of antiviral drugs. We're also focused on ensuring the healthcare system and communities throughout the country remains able to care for those who need it. CMS can now grant 1135 waivers to decompress hospitals and other facilities when they're getting overburdened, letting them use those emergency plans. And we stand ready to deploy federal assets when necessary, including vaccination teams, clinical and laboratory staff, and temporary medical facilities. And our first ever vaccination team is headed to Delaware to do uh, just that. We've also partnered closely with the private sector healthcare system, including health insurers, pharmacists, big box stores, the AMA, and the public health community, to find ways to pay for vaccine administration so cost is not a barrier to people who want to be vaccinated. Let me shift for a minute to lessons learned. Clearly, the support of Congress in the past, past few years has been critical in enabling us to respond so quickly to this pandemic. And yet it is clear the chronic underinvestment in public health, whether at the federal, state, 
or local levels or in the manufacturing infrastructure has real world consequences and we cannot afford to let this happen again ever. While we've made vaccine in record time without cutting any corners, in retrospect, our original projections were based on the collective experience with seasonal flu and with H5N1 vaccine manufacturing and were optimistic in the face of what has proved to be a daunting challenge provided by Mother Nature and despite the best efforts of federal government and our partners in the private sector. Congress and the public have rightfully asked for projections about numbers of doses and we want to be transparent but at the same time provide all of the caveats about the uncertain nature of these projections. This has been a real challenge, especially as measures are captured with shorter and shorter sound bites that omit detail about such caveats. And this has led to frustration for everyone involved, especially the public. As an important part of this transparency and part of our public-private partnership, we will start releasing this week, together with all five vaccine manufacturers, the number of projected doses by manufacturer for successive two-week periods. In this past week, storm-related delays nearly derailed shipment of vaccine to many states, from Maine to Alabama. And I want to credit the hard work of CDC and ASPR staff who worked all weekend to be sure the vaccine could be ordered and shipped so the clinics could go on as planned. But we are far from done with the science of advanced development related to vaccines and with building manufacturing capacity in the United States. We're excited that the first cell-based facility will open or have its ribbon cutting next week in North Carolina. But my fear, frankly, is when this is over, we'll decide we don't need to worry about a pandemic for the next 30 years. Nothing could be more dangerous. Despite these challenges, I think that much of what we've learned and frankly continue to learn through this pandemic and in the investments we've made to address it will serve us well in confronting future public health emergencies as well as for day-to-day -day public health for years to come. I too look forward to your questions. Thank you, Dr. Laurie. Dr. Goodman. Uh, Chairman Stupak, Chairman Pallone and uh, members of the subcommittee, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here today to describe FDA's activities in this response. Uh, first, when this uh, influenza virus emerged in the spring, we said this can't be business as usual, and we immediately stood up an incident command system response uh, with several teams, for example, in antivirals and vaccines, and this enabled us to mount a very flexible and rapid response with our partners inside and outside of government. Uh, in vaccines, our vaccine team acted immediately along with CDC to begin the steps to produce a vaccine even before there was a decision or knowledge that we were going to need one. As you heard, in record time, vaccine was produced and became available. Uh, and I can assure you, everyone in this effort, government and industry, has done everything possible to get as much vaccine to as many people as quickly as possible without cutting corners. And I know this committee is concerned that a vaccine be safe. A very important perspective here is that the entire world is struggling with the biology of this virus, the challenge of reduced manufacturing yields, and frankly, the entire world is struggling with inadequate vaccine manufacturing infrastructure. Uh, yet despite these challenges we faced in the United States and the frustration we've been talking about, this country is one of the first to mount an effective large-scale immunization campaign. Now, many people have asked us at the FDA, how can we be confident in a vaccine produ produced so quickly? We have this paradoxical situation where many people really want vaccine and many people don't trust it. Well, I'd like to say that the answer is straightforward and to reassure the American people. The vaccines we've approved are made with methods that are tried and true. Every year, FDA and vaccine manufacturers follow a series of very specific, careful steps to produce new influenza vaccines every single year. And these steps have produced safe vaccines year after year, adding up to hundreds of millions of doses manufactured and used in the United States. And we followed this exact same scientific and regulatory approach for this 2009 H1N1 vaccine. Um, in response to some of the disinformation uh, that, that was mentioned, I think, by Congresswoman uh, Castor, uh, one of the things we've done, for example, is um, my commissioner, Dr. Hamburg, uh, with our working together, sent a letter to every physician in the United States to explain about the vaccine, 
how it was produced, and to provide a balanced review of the benefits and risks of the vaccine. But clearly, we have a lot more work to do there. Um, you heard from the others that your investments in pandemic preparedness have been critically important. With respect to domestic capacity, I want to say that in May, FDA, uh, in an accelerated manner, licensed a additional facility at Santa Fe Pasteur and Swiftwater that the company has said has dramatically increased its ability to produce vaccine, and that is helping us now, so that's important. But clearly, we have much, much more to do. I would also say during this response, we've worked with HHS to bring online multiple additional filling lines to help make sure we can get the vaccine that's produced out there as quickly as possible. Now, on September 15th, we licensed four vaccines against the influenza virus, a fifth last week. And I also wanted to point out that, again, in a very collaborative effort with the CSL manufacturer who submitted data to us, we were able to extend the approval of CSL's vaccine to include children down to six months of age who we're very concerned with. Now, while we expect these vaccines to have the same excellent safety record uh, as seasonal vaccine every year, we're taking nothing for granted, the same intensive oversight of these facilities, the enhanced safety monitoring Dr. Shukit mentioned, and I want to point out that every single lot of vaccine must be evaluated, tested, and then released by both FDA and the manufacturer before it's used in people. Now, uh, because of the limited time, I won't go into the work we've done on antivirals and diagnostics. I do want to say that we've prevented, for example, through emergency use authorizations, discarding of, of antivirals that we scientifically know is safe to use, and that's helped avoid shortages. Uh, diagnostics have been fielded in record time, within weeks of a new disease, thanks to CDC's effort and our work with them collaborating to evaluate those. You've heard about protecting the public from fraudulent and counterfeit products. We almost immediately put a team in place to surf the internet, to deal with consumer complaints. Um, my favorite is the magic wand that can protect against everything, including anthrax and H1N1. But you also heard there are issues of counterfeit and unapproved medications. We're continuing to be very vigilant in this respect. Uh, and we've actually put a widget out there so others can spread the word uh, with the list of counterfeit products. Now, looking ahead, I really do feel uh, much has been accomplished in a very short time, and it's because of these strong collaborative efforts that the people you're seeing here and many more are talking every single day. We're talking with the states, we're talking with the manufacturers, and this has been going on from day one. But we need to ask ourselves, and we are asking ourselves, what do we need to do more, both right now for this epidemic and moving forward? Clearly, you've heard about we need more capacity, we need cell-based manufacturing, and we at FDA are very committed to make that happen. We recently, last year or the year before, provided guidance so we could get cell-based vaccines, but we also want those to be safe. Um, we're supporting, with HHS, development of recombinant and newer technologies that could help us respond even faster. And I think, as, as I heard from one member, this is important not just about flu. This is important about another emer other emerging infectious diseases, if we had SARS, if we had a bioterrorist attack. We need a strong, technologically advanced vaccine infrastructure. Now, due to time, I, I think I'll, I'll stop there, but just to say that we at FDA are very committed to working with our partners and you to protect the health of the American people. We've moved forward with a very flexible, rapid response while taking our responsibility about the safety of these products very uh, seriously. We really uh, want to encourage strengthening our infrastructure here. I also want to mention again that this is a global issue and we in the United States can work with global partners to strengthen the global response. None of us are safe and well protected until, from infectious diseases until we all are. So I thank you for your support for public health, your support for the FDA, and your interest in this issue. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Goodman, and thank you to all of you. The way we proceed now is we have five-minute um, period of questions from members going back and forth, Democrat, Republican. For members who passed on their opening, they get seven minutes. They get to add their opening uh, to the five. I'm going to start with myself, and I want to start with Dr. Shukat. 
Um, the big concern, the biggest concern that I hear from my constituents um, is about the distribution. And I know that the CDC has guidelines for distribution, but basically leaves the distribution up to the states as long as they meet those guidelines. Um, my concern is whether that is a good way to go about it. I mean, I, I suppose, you know, you assume that the states and the localities, since they are closer to people, would have a, a better, would be the best way to distribute, but there is, that has been seriously questioned in the last few months or so. And of course, being from New Jersey, the biggest issue has been the Wall Street uh, companies, you know, Goldman Sachs, Citigroup. Uh, I literally, being from New Jersey, hear about this constantly. You know, why is it that New York, I guess, um, you know, gave uh, uh, Goldman Sachs and Wall Street firms the opportunity to do this? I'm told that employer-based distribution is uh, one of meets your guidelines, and perhaps it was assumed that you know they would good they would do well since they have health clinics and you know, have a good distribution amongst their employees. But I guess the concern would be, you know, if, if you leave the distribution to those who do it best, and the ones that do it best happen to be, you know, high-powered Wall Street firms, then it, you know, they, they, there are two concerns. One would be, does that make sense, given that maybe a, a hospital or school might not do as well a job as distributing, but there's a greater need? And then the second thing is, uh, whether or not uh, you know some of these firms would would only give it to high risk people, and uh, as opposed to maybe their CEOs or somebody else. So, I mean that that that's the concern. I mean I, my question really would be, why does the CDC leave it up to the states to create the plan for distribution? And wouldn't and the, wouldn't it perhaps be better to have uh, you know uh, uh, some other federal mechanism rather than doing it this way? And and what prevent you know what prevents uh, um, you know, the, uh, somebody like Goldman Sachs, you know, getting uh, it when it maybe should be going to uh, a clinic and, and uh, monitoring how they go about it. Um, thank you. The CDC um, issues national standards about the populations at greatest risk for disease that are recommended to receive vaccine when there is a scarce situation. So we issue that as a national level, um, level setting. We leave it to the states or the large cities like New York City to find the best ways to put vaccine in the path of the priority populations to identify the venues. New York City actually put hospitals and doctor's offices first. They put employer clinics in a lower tier and small numbers of doses went to some employer But the clinics. problem that I'm hearing, and I'm, you know, I don't have a lot of time, is that in some of those cases, I don't remember which Wall Street firm it was, they actually had excess and didn't need it. So, you know, you could argue that maybe they're getting fewer dosages, but, you know, it may very well be that maybe all or most of what they got should have gone to the hospitals because there's a greater high risk pool there. Yeah, I think that. And what do we, that how do we prevent that? Yeah, I think that, um, that issue was of concern to all of us. Dr. Frieden sent a letter out to all of the health officers and uh, reminding people about our priority groups and how critical it is for all of us to adhere to them. Every provider or venue that gets vaccine signs an agreement that they are going to follow the recommended target populations. So no, and I, and I understand that I am not suggesting, groups. although some have, yeah. you know, that Goldman or others are giving it to people other than yeah. the high risk, although some are concerned about that. But it is just that have you thought about the fact that, you know, if you do it that way or if the states do it that way, it may be giving it to people that have a better distribution network within their employers, but they may not have as great a need. Or, I mean, it's sort of like you know when when there's a grant program and the guy that does the best has the best appl grant application person gets the grant, whereas maybe there's a greater need for the person who doesn't have an expert to do it. You know, yeah. we we have had a major commitment to to vulnerable populations and to the underserved, and to make sure that we're not leaving behind those without good access. Most of the states have carried out these larger mass clinics to get people who do not have doctor's offices to go to. Well, I, I, if to you vaccine. could just, you know, I don't know if you have it, but I, I would like to see maybe get back to me at some point and, 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 and to talk about, you know, why this kind of distribution is better as opposed to maybe looking at some kind of a federal alternative. I, I don't know to the extent that you have looked at that, but if, if you could get back to us. 
at Thank some you. point. And then the other thing I wanted to ask Dr. Lori is that when Secretary Sebelius testified before the committee on September 15th, I mean, basically she left us with the feeling that we are, were on track in terms of adequate supplies of vaccine. I know that turned out not to be the case. Some of you explained why, and I'm sure we'll get more questions from other panel. But you did mention uh, underfunding, and I don't remember her saying anything about uh, lack of funding. You, you said that there's underfunding or chronic underfunding was one of the contributing factors. That's the first time I've heard that, and I was a little disturbed because I don't remember her mentioning it. Let me try to, to, to clarify here. I think the chronic underfunding has been in the vaccine infrastructure overall, as opposed to the response. So it would have been wonderful if we had had more manufacturing capacity in the United States by this point, if we'd had, you know, cell-based or recombinant um, technologies um, that could surge and really produce large amounts of vaccine. But, you know, while we've invested in that over the past few years, um, we need to continue to make a much more robust investment. And so that's the kind of chronic underfunding for the vaccine manufacturing capacity. This. I think we all know that the chronic underfunding in state and local public health um, has, has been a different kind of problem. But Congress has been extraordinarily responsive uh, to the very acute needs that we've had to deal with this pandemic. And what I'd love to see us in a situation of <clears throat> is that we can sort of apply prevention in that sense too and really get ahead of this for the next pandemic or the next. Well, I, you know, again, I don't, I don't want to say, I don't want to beat you guys up today, but I mean, you know, when it's something like that, that Congress can make a difference, um, it really is important that if, if uh, the department or anybody feels that there's a need for more funding to, to detail that to us. Yeah. And, um, you know, again, I would ask you maybe uh, if, to get back and give us more information about this chronic underfunding in, in writing because, um, you know, a lot of things that come up here we can't do anything about, but that's certainly something that we could. If well, we look would. forward to working with you on that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have eight minutes left. We have three votes. Mr. Shimka says that he'd like to go next before we break, and then after him we'll break and come back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I'm just going to be pretty short. Uh, I'm, but I, I, I appreciate Bart's focus because in my opening statement, I, I, I hope that we do an after-action review on this process to help us be prepared because the questions that he's raising is really the questions that, that I would have under a terrorist attack, biological element, and weapons of mass destruction. And it really keys into what Barter said. Um, we have to have a way to streamline the process and get approvals quickly. And that would be the debate on L egg versus cell and how quickly. I understand the FDA's responsibility, but, but if you have a massive possible pandemic, we better have a way to subvert the regular order for the needs of the, of the whole and move rapidly, just like uh, Bart's comments on the adjuvant. And, and w I hope there is a process in place. And if there's not one, I'm a former military, uh, and after every training exercise, you do an after action review. And is, will that be done, uh, Dr. Shukat? Yeah, what I can say is we've actually had several in-process reviews already, and we are committed to after-action reviews as part of our routine procedures. Dr. Lurie, anyone else want to? I, I, I would add to that, and I would also add that there are processes in place now through emergency use authorizations so that if this pandemic were to become much more severe, et cetera, we would be able to shift uh, to other products under an emergency use authorization. And that's been part of our pandemic planning since 2005. And because if something hits that we don't even know about and we're looking at this timeline, then I guess we just I identify it and then isolate people until we can roll out you know, some... Uh, Absolutely. There, there are several mitigation steps, and one of the things we did this summer is update guidance for mitigation, when, what to do with the current level of severity and what we might do if the virus mutated and was much more severe. So no automatic school closures in this setting, but if things change substantially, we would go to much more um, dis disruptive interventions. And so we do have things that we are, were available to us knowing that vaccine supply might not come soon enough. Yeah, Dr. Goodman. 
Yeah, I really appreciate your comments, and we want to have a very agile public health response, especially in an emergency. I do want to mention that in, in that respect, it took us about a day or two when there was a need for antiviral, not approved for children under one year old, but to treat children under one year old, to work with our colleagues at NIH and CDC and issue an emergency use authorization. Full transparency to the public, not the kind of data required for approval, but appropriate risk benefit weighing in a public health response. This is a tool you and Congress have given, it, given us and we're ready to use it when there's the right emergency. And as recently in the last couple of weeks with respect to the adjuvant question, the senior scientists of every agency have sat together and revisited that decision and decided, do we want at this point to switch to adjuvants? It's a very complex discussion, but that is being revisited in action and we're committed to continuing to visit it after action. The biggest improvements we can make are strengthening this infrastructure and getting new technologies ready ahead of time. Um, we're better prepared than we were a few years ago, thanks to your investment, but we have a long way to go. And, I, and I'll just end by saying I think education is a key, and, and the, what, what's the positive aspect is, is the public is really better stewards of everybody else's public health by better health practices, and that will be the key thing before we can roll into this. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for letting me get this in. Thank you. So we have three votes, and we'll come right back after that. The subcommittee is in recess. Well, let her. The subcommittee will reconvene, and um, our next uh, member is uh, the gentlewoman from Wisconsin, Ms. Baldwin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, Chairman. Um, I mentioned in my opening statements three topics that I, I hope to hear more on. I know that I won't get a chance to exhaust those three topics in Q&A, but let me, um, let me start uh, with Dr. Lurie on uh, the issue generally of domestic uh, uh, production of vaccine. Uh, you had been asked a question by um, Mr. Walden that I think time didn't permit you to finish answering regarding the policies in other countries where uh, vaccine is uh, manufactured. Uh, and, and I wondered if you could basically generalize those policies, but also tell us specifically what happened in the case in Australia. Sure. I think uh, many countries, in, including the United States, in the United States we have um, the Defense Production Act, and, and basically what that tells us is that if we need, you know, material for the safety and security of this country, that we can, we can prioritize that. And I think many countries um, have that kind of situation that they need to prioritize for their home country. That's why it's so important for us to get to domestic manufacturing capacity in the United States. It's actually something that we learned and realized during our pandemic planning early on. And in fact, even earlier than that, when we realized several years ago that we were down just to one licensed flu manufacturer in the United States. And I think people have worked very hard to get to the point that we are today. And now we need to get to the point where we have a much more domestic manufacturing capacity. I think in the case of, of CSL, you know, they're um, based in Australia and they have a similar kind of uh, arrangement and requirement with the Australian government. You remember that the Southern Hemisphere has its outbreak at a different time. And so Australia has, was experiencing a pretty severe outbreak and um, decided that it needed vaccine first for its home country. Now, when that happened, um, CSL let us know that right away. We immediately were able to downgrade our projected numbers of doses of vaccines. And at the same time, we've worked very closely with the manufacturer so that as soon as they met the requirement for their home country, um, they were able to start uh, making and, and shipping doses to us. You know, in addition, I think, as, as you heard, they've um, also submitted additional data recently so that their vaccine can be used uh, down to a uh, lower age in children, and that was really recently licensed. Um, I, I also, in my opening statement, talked a little bit about um, using uh, this pandemic, this uh, uh, seasonal flu, as well as the H1N1, to, to learn and to innovate. And I'm wondering um, what your thoughts are in three particular uh, areas. One is 
um, faster manufacturing processes, whether it's cell-based um, or things that uh, other other opportunities there, use of adjuvants and um, alternative methods of vaccine delivery. Uh, uh, you know, something other than injection and, and nasal spray. If we were to have a very virulent um, uh, influenza next year, where would we be in a year that we aren't today? Uh, what's, your, what's your sort of time horizon for when these innovations are going to be more uh, generally available? You know, I think it's a, a really great question. I think, again, um, you know, BARDA is in right now year three of a five-year strategic plan to really try to move us toward uh, modern manufacturing, more modern manufacturing technologies and manufacturing capacity uh, in the United States. Um, as I said, uh, the first cell-based facility has its ribbon cutting next week um, in North Carolina, but it actually I don't think is going to be able to make flu vaccine um, for another year. But when all said and done, that ought to get us to the point where we can, they'll be able to make I think 150 million doses. So that's still far short of the capacity that we would, the surge capacity, we would, we would need in a public health emergency. In addition, cell-based vaccines still require the virus to grow in cells. And so we need to move toward, you know, recombinant technologies and other kinds of technologies. Um, we have invested um, in some of those. I think it's, I think there's a lot of promise in a number of the new methodologies. It's, I can't yet predict when they're going to come online, but I also want to say that it's great to be able to do those things, but once you do them, we can't forget that we have to manufacture to scale with whatever those are. And so we have to be thinking now about, you know, how those new technologies and manufacturing capacity meet one another. So not everything is done, you know, one after another. And so that's, I think, another real challenge that we have. With regard to adjuvants, I think, you know, we all know and believe that adjuvants have a lot of promise. And just to to um, reiterate, adjuvants really are used for two reasons. One is so you need less vaccine. The other is if you don't get a good immune response to that vaccine, um, they help you get a better immune response. It's a substance that you mix with the vaccine. Um, there's a lot of work going on right as we speak to understand the experience with adjuvants, trials being done by the manufacturers, uh, as well as by NIH mixing one company's adjuvant with another country's vaccine to be sure that those things are safe and effective. And depending on the outcome of those trials, um, you know, I would expect that if they're promising that the manufacturers will submit applications to the FDA, um, but that we're not there yet. And then in terms of the alternative methods, um, People are working on things like patches, you know, a transdermal method. Some people are working on vaccines that you can eat. Um, you know, there's a lot of very exciting breakthroughs uh, in the science that I think are going to move us far forward. Some are more ready than others, but it would be great if you could use a patch in not, instead of a shot, for example. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it's my understanding that some of that technology also may have an impact on increasing the effectiveness of the vaccine. You know, for example, uh, skin, um, you know, microneedle uh, application versus injection. Right. And I think we're continuing uh, to learn more about those. But I think some, a lot of these new technologies are very promising in terms of also being able to get a better immune response. It's really the immune response and it's sort of how it gets into the body to make that immune response that is the difference in some of these different technologies. I don't know, Dr. Goodman might want to amplify on that. You know, I would just add one thing, which is <clears throat> there is a lot of amazing innovation, incredibly promising technologies. We have licensed cell-based vaccines in this country, just not for influenza. That's been a real challenge. We have licensed recombinant vaccines in this country, just not yet for influenza. And I think those things are making some really real technological progress, and those are things that we're going to see progress in very soon. But, you know, one thing I wanted to say is we see even in the most sophisticated manufacturing technologies, there are still challenges producing large amounts of things consistently and of high quality. So even with some of the most advanced biotechnology products out there today, this is complex, challenging manufacturing. And uh, it's not like just, I mean, the egg has been amazingly efficient and for all some of the problems, uh, relatively reliable. Clearly, it's an old technology. It has many disadvantages. 
but I'm just pointing out that some of the newer technologies are going to need the same kind of care and that what works in a mouse or what works in a very small production is not always the same that uh, and it sometimes takes some time to get it to industrial scale and be sure it's going to be safe and, and high quality for people. But we're all working together to accelerate that because our goal should be for an emerging infectious disease threat to have vaccines, you know, much, much faster, you know, much, much faster. And there's promising technology that can help us do that. Thank you. Um, I want to thank all of you. Uh, for uh, your comments today, and um, I know that um, I know that we did have um, some questions uh, that I and others asked if you could get back to us in writing. The process is that uh, members can submit additional questions in writing to you, and usually they're they're supposed to be submitted within the next ten days. So you may get some additional. Uh, written questions to respond to as well. But thank you very much, really, for such an important issue and that you're so involved in it. You had some comments? Well, I just wondered if it might be okay if I just responded to something I heard in a couple of comments earlier because I of was. Of course. I was just very concerned, and, and we haven't really had a, a chance to, to, I think, correct some misunderstandings here. And that has to do with vaccines going to Guantanamo or vaccines going to terrorists. There are no, there's no vaccine on its way to Guantanamo. There's no um, plan to vaccinate uh, terrorists or Khalid Sheikh Mohammed um, head of anybody else right now. There's a, there's a program that's handled by DOD, but I think it's one of those things that gets out there in a soundbite and it sort of travels virally and there's a lot of misinformation um, out there. There's, there's no vaccine on its way there. All right. Thank you very much. And, and and did you not, did you want to, I'm sorry, Mr. Gingrich's here. He hasn't had a chance to ask a question, so go ahead. The gentleman from Georgia is recognized. Mr. Chairman, thank you. I, I'm pleased that the first panel is still here. Uh, <clears throat> you know, I have some concerns, and I, 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 in the interest of full disclosure, I've been a bit of a doubting Thomas uh, as a physician member. Uh, about our response to this uh, crisis, this uh, pandemic as it is now. And of course, my, my great concern was us creating a pandemic of fear. I think we have certainly done that. <clears throat> and we also have, since uh, 2006, when we were dealing with avian flu, uh, probably in the aggregate have appropriated something like $12, 13000000000 billion. Uh, feel free to correct me if I'm wrong on my numbers, but a lot of money. And, uh, of course, as we track this, and the concern was whether or not to, to develop and spend billions of dollars in the process and develop uh, a vaccine specific to H1N1, different, of course, from the, from the regular vaccine that we, we will be producing for seasonal flu. Uh, I think the decision was going to be made, I guess was made, on the basis of uh, how virulent this strain uh, became and what kind of uh, changes might, might occur. Uh, was it getting worse? Uh, and, and I think that you, you've said in your testimony, uh, maybe all three of you, that uh, it, it really, the strain really hasn't gotten worse and the virulence uh, has not increased. Uh, but one thing that I did notice here lately was that from all of a sudden we went from 1,000 deaths in the United States uh, literally overnight to 4,000. And that's a little, I find a little disingenuous, uh, but there's been this explanation that, oh, well, we originally were basing uh, cases of H1N1 on laboratory evidence. But now we are using a mathematical formula that we kind of extrapolate or estimate. It, you know, the, some, some people maybe in the CDC ought to go to work for the Census Bureau uh, with, that, with that, those kind of calculations. And I, mean, I, I have real concerns about that. And I, in fact, I brought along with me a, a, a blank death certificate where it you know, says cause of death and contributing factors and that sort of thing. And I, and I would be really curious to know uh, how many of those 4,000 cases does the death certificate say the cause of death uh, is H1N1 viral influenza? 
Um, thanks for those comments. Um, communication is really important to all of us and being clear and not um, uh, confusing. We did not overnight go from 1,000 deaths to 4,000 deaths. All along, we've been talking about using a variety of surveillance systems appropriate to the period of the pandemic and the efficiency of data collection. And we've said that reported cases underestimate the true burden of disease. With seasonal influenza, when we talk about how many deaths or how many hospitalizations they are, that's not based on individual reporting by doctors and health departments or so forth. It's based on looking at a lot of different data sources and modeling those data. What we did last week was release estimates that took information from a couple very good surveillance systems, hospitalization data from our emerging infections program network in 10 different states, um, information from 30 or 35 states, depending on the week, about laboratory confirmed hospitalizations and laboratory confirmed deaths. We use those two as a ratio to understand from hospitalizations how many deaths might there be. We looked at the influenza-like illness surveillance system, our sentinel providers, to divide up states into high, medium, and low at any one time in terms of how, how common the transmission was. And then we used correction factors that were based on community surveys done to really understand for how, how many illnesses are in the community, you know, based on household telephone surveys, for everyone who actually goes and sees a doctor. How many people that see a doctor get a lab test? And Dr. Shelke, with all due respect, because my time is limited, I want to make one other point. And I appreciate your explanation. <clears throat> and I hope all of the panelists, all three doctors, understand my concern. Uh, the State University of West Georgia is in my district, in Carrollton, Georgia. Uh, and they weren't <clears throat> having a problem getting access to the vaccine. And I know that's been the main theme of this hearing, uh, why we didn't develop uh, the, uh, the I don't know, uh, millions, literally 50 million vaccines by date certain October, and it was only 15 million or whatever. But State University of West Georgia had no problem. They had plenty of vaccines. They have 11,500 students, and only 141 uh, were willing to be vaccinated. And, and a lot of them are very concerned. And, and I'll, let, let me just give you a quick quote. Most students are saying that they haven't gotten the swine flu yet, so they believe that they are not going to get it at all, uh, said Chandra Jones, a student who is from Franklin, Georgia. There are also people telling students not to get the shot. There are some who are afraid of the side effects of the shot, and they've read about 1976 and Guillain-Barre syndrome. Uh, they believe that the government did not test the shot enough, end quote. Mr. Chairman, I know I've ex extended beyond my time if the panel, if you would allow them as a courtesy to respond to this, because I think this is a, a huge issue. Uh, I don't care if we, you know, if we've got 100 million vaccines uh, and 10 percent of the population is willing to take the vaccine, even those that are high risk, what have we really accomplished here? If I, I'm going to let uh, you answer Mr. Gingrey's question, um, and also, but I got to be careful here, Dr. Lurie, because you opened it up to the Guantanamo thing. Um, Chairman Stupak wants to say something too, so we'll we'll do those two, and then we'll be okay. done. <laughs> oh no, we're not done. Mr. Green is here. I give up. <laughs> All right, Mr. Okay. Gingrey, respond so, to Mr. Gingrey. Sure. Um, you raise um, one of the most challenging aspects of this pandemic. At the very same time, people are waiting in line, driving hours to find vaccine. We have um, supply way in excess of demand in some communities. We have huge information needs to fill, and I think we are really committed to um, break the myths about the, the safety of this vaccine, what we do know and what we don't know. Um, there's a website, flu.gov, that has a lot of information about myths and facts that might help some of the college students understand what is the case. We've actually planned for some more outreach for um, youth such as college students to try to reach them and have them understand what is the threat to them, what are the risks or not about the vaccine. But we have this very exquisitely challenging time where do we risk raising demand in some communities like that at the same time we have so much extra demand versus our supply elsewhere. And that's one of the reasons why we've really focused on state and local support because in your community, your public health experts understand on the ground, you know, we got a supply demand mismatch the other way at West Georgia College, whereas in, a, in um, the national level, we may not really understand the community's supply and demand. And so really one of our reasons to focus on state and local 
distribution or direction of where the vaccine goes is because of that trust of the community and that awareness of what's going on with the local community. Um, so I think let, if you, if you want to get back to Gitmo, okay. right, okay. okay. Are you done with uh, Mr. Gingrey's uh, response? Okay. Uh, Mr. Green, let me just explain what happened is it looked like we were done and there was nobody here. So, Ms. so Dr. Lori asked to take some time to talk about terrorists in Guantanamo and Mr. Stupak just wanted to uh, clarify uh, and ask a question about that and then we'll go to you. Dr. Lori, yeah. you don't have anything to do with the military and, and getting the control of the drug to the military, do you? No, this whole program is run by the Department of Defense. Right. Right. And so, so you don't know if people at Guantanamo has received it, if anyone at Guantanamo has got it. You don't know if the 218 international terrorists we hold in U.S. jails has received it. You don't know that because that's handled by so, a different so part. What I, what I can tell you is, like all military installations, um, what is your source then? If, if run you're by the Department of Defense. And they have pretty strict criteria, just like we Correct. Know how they, they prioritize do. vaccine, going to U.S. forces, Correct. deployed health care workers, civilians and contractors. Correct. But the point is. Civilians, et cetera. So I just, but, I heard. But, but the point is, under oath, you said they did not receive it. You don't know that. When Dr. When, when Major Diana R. Haney says they'll be receiving it on November 2nd, they could already have the vaccines down in Guantanamo on, this was November 2nd, it's now what, the 18th? 16 days ago. They could have it there. You really don't have any personal knowledge of it. No, I'm sorry. What I was trying to do was co correct a misconception about how the vaccine was distributed. I do not have correct. personal knowledge of that. Correct. I realize uniformed personnel first and are required to do it. And even these detainees will have a right to accept it or refuse it. But the point being, this was released November 2nd at the time of the height of the shortages and American people were upset about it. I have no problem, but I just say, you're under oath. Don't be testifying things you don't have any personal knowledge of. Fair, fair enough. All right. Um, Mr. Green. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I appreciate the patience of our witnesses. You've been here a long time, plus you had to listen to our opening statements. But that's just the way it works here sometimes. Uh, <laughs> I, I appreciate you being here. And I guess the frustration is because we've had both the health subcommittee and I'm a benefit. I'm both on the health subcommittee and the oversight. And we've had a number of hearings since the spring and the most recent one in September. Um, and it seemed like the, the best plans that we had uh, just didn't pan out. Uh, and it's not necessarily with the delivery system. We'll hear from that at the next panel. We have the commissioner, and, and, uh, but we'll also have on the manufacturing side the next panel. But, you know, there's been talk for many years about what we need to do for pandemics. And yet here we have uh, what relatively is, uh, can be major, a month ago, we had a Homeland Security hearing in Houston, Texas, and we had 1,000 people died. Uh, now it's up to 4,000. If it had been something much worse than H1N1, um, we would be sitting here and saying, why are we, why are we having thousands, you know, tens of thousands of people dying for avian flu? Uh, what, would, what do we need to do, or the agencies, all your agencies and even Congress need to do to, to live up to the plans and the expectations that we had in the earlier hearings where we, we were, you know, we were going to have enough vaccine. We have, the distribution center system was there. Right now, we don't know if the distribution center is there simply because we don't have enough vaccines, although we know something's working because people are lining up all over the country to, to receive it. And the other question I have is that my concern is that the lack of regular flu vaccine, uh, or at least the participation. And the one thing we know now is hopefully next year or the next flu season, we will have H1N1 in with the uh, with the seasonal flu, but that we need to make a national effort uh, to to increase the seasonal flu vaccinations, and uh, and that comes from from all of us. We have seen a little uptick because of the fear of H1N1, but I want to see what we can do to, uh, to the cheapest thing we can do for the business community is a flu shot for their employees. So with that, uh, you know, in the time I have two and a half minutes to. Uh, uh, for all three of you from your age. Yeah, I, th I think there's several things we could do to strengthen our response for seasonal flu as well as for a, a future pandemic, which I do believe we will have. We have um, a public health infrastructure that's that's weak right now. It has been um, suffered many job losses, many furloughs, and it leaves us a little bit of a weakened core to respond to this kind of thing. We do not sufficiently use information technology 
that could help collect, connect the electronic health records in the private health care system with public health needs. We could do much better targeting of priority groups if we had better information systems. Some states have immunization registries that work pretty well, but they don't often reach to adults. We don't have a strong adult immunization program in the U.S. Adult providers haven't yet really stepped up the way pediatricians have to use prevention as the, at the well, forefront. And, and I appreciate that, and we're going to run out of time. But we're talking about pediatricians, and we have a, a really robust vaccination system for, for children. We know H1N1 targets children and young adults. I had my 62nd birthday three weeks ago, and the first time I said, I'm glad I'm 62 because H1N1 doesn't hit us that much. But even but with we children, have that actually. System now, the yeah. problem is we don't have the vaccination. Right. I think there's two things, though. With children, we certainly need a more robust vaccine production with a new technology, a broader information, uh, broader manufacturing capacity. But with children, if, if you look at this pandemic, it's really disproportionately affecting school age children, and they don't go to the pediatricians very often, and they don't get vaccinated very often compared to younger children, one year olds and two year olds. And so there's a tremendous opportunity to strengthen immunization for school-aged children. Many states are having great experiences with school-located vaccination for H1N1. Those could be models for seasonal flu, for instance, in the future. But there's a, a lot of work to, to do before we would realize the a very efficient de delivery system that we'd like to have. I don't know if you want to add. Certainly, I, and I would really um, second uh, Dr. Shukat's comments about really strengthening the public health infrastructure at all levels. Um, in addition, as, as we've talked about some already this morning, uh, we do need to get to um, much more robust manufacturing technologies. Um, we talked about the fact that there are some promising new developments, and we need to continue to invest in um, pulling those kinds of technologies along so that they can make um, vaccine faster and more reliably, and then that, that those new developments have to somehow meet the large-scale safe manufacturing capacity so that were we to have another emerging infectious disease, another kind of pandemic, that we would be able to get vaccine out in very large quantities much faster um, and not be reliant on the vagaries that we have now. Mr. Chairman, I know I've run out of time, but those of us who are from the sugar cube generation that dealt with polio, I know we use that example many times in our hearings. I think our agencies need to look at that and say, how do we deal with this? Uh, because next time, it won't just make us sick for a few days. It may be killing a lot more people than it is 4,000, because we lose 36,000 people every year from regular seasonal flu. Uh, but, but I'm worried about the pandemic on something much more serious. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I guess I'm going to say thank you again. <laughs> I won't repeat what I said again, though. But Thank you so much, and um, again, get back to us with any uh, written comments. We would appreciate it. And now we'll call the second panel. Thank you. No, you don't want to. No, come on. No, I'm going to stay, but I, I, you might as well chair. We've uh, done a little switching here, and we'll call our second panel witness up. This panel includes Mr. Paul Perrault, the president of CSL Biotherapies Incorporated, Dr. Vas Narashiman, hopefully I said that right, uh, is president of Norvitis Vaccines USA, Dr. Ben Mikasha is executive vice president of operations for Mediamine, and Dr. Philip Hosback is Vice President of Immunization Policy and Government Relations for Santa Fe Pastor. Dr. Lakey is Commissioner of the Texas Department of Health Services. And Dr. Jeff, Jeffrey Levy is Executive Director of Trust for America's Health. I welcome all of our witnesses to testifying here today. In accordance with the policy of the Oversight and Investigation Subcommittee, witness testimony will be taken under oath. Please be advised that under the rules of the House, you have the right to be advised by counsel during your testimony. Do any of you wish to be represented by counsel? Everyone's shaking their head no, so I'll take that as a no. Therefore, I'm going to ask you to please rise, raise your right hand to take the oath. You swear or affirm testimony you're about to give to be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but truth, matter pending before this committee. 
Let the record reflect the witnesses that have replied in the affirmative. You're now under oath. We will now hear a five-minute opening statement from each of our witnesses. You may submit a longer statement for inclusion in the hearing record. Uh, Mr. Perrault, we'll start with you. And uh, for five minutes, please, sir, your opening statement. It, Mr. Pro, you might want to pull that mic up and make sure the green light's on, a little button there. There we go. There we go. All right, and we'll start the clock. We'll be all set. Go ahead, sir. So good afternoon, Chairman Stupak and Chairman Pallone, members of the committee. I'm Paul Perot, president of CSL Biotherapies Incorporated, the U.S. distributor of influenza vaccines manufactured by our parent company, CSL Limited, located in Melbourne, Australia. Pleased to be here today to discuss our experience in manufacturing the H1N1 vaccine specifically for the United States. CSL Biotherapies believes it is important to understand how the government and industry can best work together to help assure vaccine availability for influenza pandemics. I want to ensure this committee that CSL Biotherapies is committed to providing the entire amount of both the H1N1 bulk antigen and the finished vaccine doses that we have agreed to in our contract with the Department of Health and Human Services. We take the H1N1 pandemic very seriously and have been a leader in developing and delivering vaccine to combat this virus. CSL has manufactured vaccines since its founding in 1916. Our world-class influenza vaccine production facilities have the capacity to produce up to 80 million doses of trivalent seasonal influenza vaccine annually. Our seasonal flu vaccine, Afluria, was launched in the United States in October 2007 and indicated for ages 18 and above and as you heard Dr. Goodman state last week, Afluria and our H1N1 vaccines received FDA approval for administration to individuals six months through 17 years of age as well. Afluria and our H1N1 vaccine come in multi-dose vials and thimerosal-free pre-filled syringes. CSL initiated the Western world's first human trials with the 2009 H1N1 vaccine and published our research findings in the New England Journal of Medicine demonstrating the efficacy of a single 15 microgram dose. These data, along with the results of clinical trials in infants and children's, were communicated rapidly to regulatory and public health authorities in the United States and globally, recognizing their value to public health decision making. In May 2009, HHS and BARDA approached CSL Biotherapies to inquire whether we might be able to provide an H1N1 vaccine for the United States. CSL Biotherapies entered into a one-year special contract initiated on May 28, 2009, to provide 36 million dose equivalents of H1N1 bulk antigen to the United States government. CSL Biotherapies did not have a previous pandemic contract with the United States government. As part of the agreement signed in May, CSL Biotherapies made it clear that the company had a pre-existing contractual obligation with the Australian government to provide vaccine to that nation first should WHO declare a pandemic. I want to stress that this had no impact on fulfilling our schedule submitted to BARDA. On June 1, 2009, CSL received the first H1N1 virus vaccine seed from the New York Medical College. The yields from this lot were approximately one-third to one-half of the average H1N1 seasonal influenza yield. As a result of these low yields, CSL formally communicated to BARDA a delay to the overall timing of the H1N1 bulk antigen delivery. On the 18th of August, CSL received a new vaccine virus C that was introduced into the manufacturing process. Yield improvements in excess of 80% compared to the previous seed were observed. A revised supply schedule was sent to HHS on September 14th incorporating production on this seed lot. CSL remains committed to maximizing the yield and availability of H1N1 vaccine. CSL has invested in fill and finish capabilities in Europe and Kankakee, Illinois to improve the availability of influenza vaccine. The Kankakee facility has achieved licensing of its new state-of-the-art syringe fill and finish line this past September. I'd like to recommend measures to help assure availability of pandemic vaccine. First, I would recommend there be a focus on producing a greater assortment of influenza seed lots earlier that can be utilized in the creation of future pandemic influenza vaccines. The poor yields resulting from the first available seed lot had a significant effect on reducing the amount of available H1N1 vaccine. If the 10-week gap in identifying the second higher yielding seed lot could have been avoided, higher output could have occurred sooner. Second, new adjuvants can help to enhance the immune response and redu reduce required dosing, which would make more antigen available for additional vaccinations. 
a supportive environment for development of new adjuvants with influenza vaccine could facilitate in this advancement. Finally, more education about the benefit of influenza vaccination and the achievement of higher vaccination rates closer to CDC recommendations would help to prevent influenza and support readiness. Our passion at CSL Biotherapies is to help save and improve lives, and we wish to do our part in protecting the United States population from H1N1 and seasonal influenza. We'll continue to work with the government collaboratively. Thank you for the opportunity to speak before the committee, and I welcome the opportunity to answer any questions. Thank you. Doctor, would you like to testify? Pull that up and turn that mic on, please. Thank you. Good afternoon. I want to thank Chairman, uh, Chairman Stupak, Chairman Pallone, Ranking Member Walden, and the distinguished members of the committee for the opportunity to speak with you today. Novartis Vaccines and Diagnostics is a leading, leading global vaccine manufacturer headquartered in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Along with our predecessor companies, we have been a leader in the development and supply of influenza vaccines to the United States for over 25 years. Today I would like to highlight to the committee Novartis Vaccine's commitment to U.S. influenza pandemic preparedness and our dedication to help prevent every possible illness and death from influenza. We commend HHS for its global leadership in pandemic preparedness over the past five years. We have had a broad and successful partnership with HHS, including active collaborations on cell culture vaccines, adjuvants, stockpiles, and new production facilities. Novartis Vaccines has committed approximately $1 billion in influenza vaccine development and production since 2006. Importantly, with HHS support, we are constructing the first flu cell culture manufacturing facility in the United States, located in Holly Springs, North Carolina, and with its ribbon, cut ribbon cutting later this month. This facility will help ensure the rapid availability of pandemic vaccine for the American people in the future. For this pandemic, we have continued our commitment to U.S. pandemic response and public health. First in May, we voluntarily dedicated the entire vaccine output from our ma manufacturing facility in Liverpool, England, to the United States. This facility represents over half of our global egg-based manufacturing capacity. We did this because of our long partnership with HHS, foregoing the potential opportunity to quadruple the output of this facility using our MF59 adjuvant. Second, our entire organization has worked around the clock to support U.S. vaccine production. We have made large new investments, added 300 additional staff, accelerated new production lines, and have been operating our production facility with a high level of quality and efficiency. Third, we rapidly started and enrolled a broad range of clinical trials in more than 9,000 children and adults in less than three months. Our data showed in early September a single dose as opposed to two is adequate for adolescents and adults, and we recently showed that a half dose might be sufficient. Fourth, we have prepared for HHS to use our MF59 adjuvant that is currently licensed and being used exclusively in our products outside the U.S. for H1N1. We have demonstrated in recent U.S. pivotal clinical trials that our adjuvant could significantly increase U.S. H1N1 vaccine supply. Fifth, we successfully supplied 27 million doses of seasonal flu vaccine to the U.S. by early October. Now, most importantly, in partnership with the U.S. government, we have overcome tremendous challenges to produce a safe and effective pandemic vaccine in less than three months. These challenges have included low yields, multiple production uncertainties, and compressed timelines. Despite these challenges, as of today, Novartis Vaccines has shipped over 18 million unadjuvanted doses to the U.S. government, and we are fully on track with our production, a tremendous joint accomplishment. We also believe, based on the experience this year, there are important opportunities to improve pandemic preparedness in the future. These opportunities include the need to move manufacturing into the 21st century for influenza vaccines using new technologies, such as our cell culture-based technology now being used, uh, licensed for seasonal and pandemic use in Europe. There's a need to accelerate regulatory pathways for novel influenza adjuvants and pandemic vaccines. We need to develop new testing methodologies to speed up vaccine formulation and quality release, which can often slow down vaccine availability. We need to maintain the strategic national stockpile for rapid deployment in the case of a severe pandemic. And finally, as noted by other members, we must support seasonal influenza vaccination demand to ensure that suppliers are not forced out of the market, as has happened in the past. Novartis Vaccines continues to do everything possible to maximize the rapid supply of a safe and effective vaccine in close collaboration with HHS. We believe that when taken into full context, the productive public-private partnership to produce, test, and deliver a safe and effective H1N1 vaccine to the U.S. has been a remarkable success. 
We are fully committed together with HHS now and in the future to ensure we achieve our shared goal of preventing every influenza case in the United States. Thank you. I welcome your questions. Thank you, Dr. Dr. McKelsa. Your testimony, please. Turn the green light on and pull it forward. Thank you. Okay. Chairman Stupak and Pallone, ranking members, Walden and Dune, members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to address you today. My name is Ben Magilse. I'm the Executive Vice President of Operations for MedImmune, and um, I'm also chairing the MedImmune's H1N1 Preparedness Committee. Mm -hmm. uh, MedImmune changed the landscape of influenza vaccination when we launched Flu Mist in 2003, representing the first innovative development in flu vaccines in over 60 years. This year, MedImmune has contracted with BARDA to deliver nearly 42 million doses of intranasal vaccine based on our Flumis technology. Um, between September and 2009 we, uh, and February 2010, we plan to deliver those doses. Um, the 42 million doses of H1N1 vaccine, along with fulfilling our commitment of 10 million doses of seasonal vaccine, represent an increase of 700% in MedImmune's vaccines production compared to last season. Importantly, MedImmune's manufacturing for H1N1 had no impact on our commitment to deliver 10 million doses of seasonal vaccine. In fact, we were able to accelerate seasonal delivery and we delivered the first H1N1 vaccine this season to BARDA. Due to manufacturing efficiencies and high vaccine yields, unique to our technology, the intranasal vaccine was the first available and remains a significant proportion of the vaccine available to date. We have finished the manufacturing of all 42 million bulk doses of vaccine, all of which is now on U.S. soil. We are now in the process of filling the vaccine in the specialized single-dose nasal sprayers. As of Friday, November 13, we have shipped approximately 13.2 million doses and are over 96% on track with delivering the orders BARDA has placed. MedImmune's unique technology provided a significant surge capacity for bulk vaccine. This success validates MedImmune's technology as a strategic asset in pandemic preparedness. As a result of MedImmune's excess bulk vaccine, we have submitted a proposal to BARDA regarding an alter alternative delivery device in order to further contribute to public health ef effort. The development and manufacturing process for our intranasal vaccine differs from that of the shot in several important ways. We develop our own unique master fire seed to grow the vaccine, while most of other manufacturers rely on CDC or other reference labs to generate the master fire seed. Crit critical to pandemic preparedness efforts is that we use a patented technology known as reverse genetics to rapidly create multiple strains, and then we can select one that grows well in eggs and has the other necessary properties too. Like the shot, our vaccine is also produced in eggs. However, unlike the shot, we generate between 60 and 100 doses of vaccine per egg. Longer term, replacing egg-based technology with cell culture manufacturing would be a key advancement for new influenza vaccines. In fact, we believe that cell culture technology uh, used to manufacture intranasal vaccine will have similar yield advantages as the one I mentioned in the egg-based technology. MedImmune has an R&D program focused on the development of a cell culture-based vaccine. However, FDA requirements have increased the cost and duration of the development program by several years, and this program is now on hold while MedImmune and HHS evaluate the appropriate path forward. Now is the time to collectively evaluate what we have accomplished and what we can do better. It is critical that the U.S. government continue to encourage high level of seasonal vaccination as well invest in public education campaigns that increase awareness of the benefits and options in, inf in influenza vaccination. Additionally, it's key that the government agencies and industry jointly develop a blueprint for processes and requirements across a number of key areas, including, for example, clinical development, regulatory requirements, and distribution, to avoid any roadblocks that could delay delivery of vaccine in the future. In a few years that BARDA has been in existence, we believe they have done a remarkable job. MedImmune is pleased to be delivering intranasal vaccine in line with BARDA's expectations. And we look forward to building up our successful relationship and collaboration with the U.S. government. Uh, I will be pleased to answer any questions.
Thank you, Doctor. Mr. Hosback, uh, your testimony, please. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for the opportunity to testify before the subcommittees regarding H1N1 influenza uh, pandemic production, development, and delivery. My name is Phil Hosbach, and I am the Vice President of Immunization Policy and Government Relations for Sanofi Pasteur, and I am currently responsible for coordinating the company's worldwide and U.S. pandemic response teams. Sanofi Pasteur is the largest manufacturer of influenza vaccine globally and in the United States, producing about 45 percent of the U.S. annual influenza vaccine supply. We are the only manufacturer of an activated flu vaccine on U.S. soil, and all of our seasonal and H1N1 vaccines for the U.S. market are produced in Swiftwater, Pennsylvania. This site, which includes two state-of-the-art influenza vaccine manufacturing facilities, and one of those was just licensed this year, as you heard from Dr. Goodman, they are operating 24 hours a day, seven days a week, with more than 2,000 dedicated people involved in some way in getting the vaccine out the door. Many of these people have made great personal sacrifices to ensure that we produce the largest number of H1N1 vaccine doses in the shortest amount of time while ensuring vaccine safety and regulatory compliance. I would like to start my remarks today by focusing on what a remarkable achievement the U.S. response to this pandemic really is. Thanks to the close collaboration of industry with HHS, FDA, and CDC, we were better prepared for this pandemic than we would have been at any other time in history. The virus was identified in late April. Manufacturers received the seed strains from CDC in late May. Less than four weeks later, large-scale manufacturing was initiated, and by early October, there was an FDA-approved vaccine being administered. It truly is a success story. Nevertheless, we certainly understand the committee's interest in this process, as there are always opportunities to improve. Sanofi Pasteur began shipping H1N1 vaccine on September 29th, which was earlier than anticipated. We have received orders from HHS for 75.3 million doses of bulk antigen to be delivered by the end of the year. We will meet this commitment. While Sanofi Pasteur represents only 75 million doses of the 250 million doses purchased by HHS, I am proud to say we represent almost 50 percent of what has been delivered to CDC to date. Sanofi Pasteur has largely succeeded in producing the H1N1 vaccine as initially projected. However, there were some factors that impacted even our considerable abilities and extensive preparation. The most significant factor initially was the lower than expected production yield for the seed strain. It is an unfortunate fact of mother nature, but we sometimes see lower yielding strains even for seasonal flu. However, the initial yields for H1N1 were exceptionally low. Utilizing our expertise, we have been able to optimize the productivity of the seed virus. Our current H1N1 yields should not be a significant factor going forward. Since April 30th, we have participated in weekly phone calls with HH agents, HHS agencies, including BARDA, CDC, FDA, and NIH, during which we provided ongoing updates. We have always been transparent about our progress. We now project that we will not only catch up completely, but we may even be ahead of schedule in the coming weeks. The media coverage regarding H1N1 vaccine shortages have spurred some to question whether the egg-based manufacturing technology might be outdated. The egg-based vaccine production method we currently use has seen many technological advancements and is a very sophisticated process that has proven adaptable to emergency situations like the current pandemic. In fact, this year provides us with an opportunity to directly compare the availability of flu vaccines produced with egg-based technology and those produced in Europe using cell culture. In the end, each of the methods, each of the methods used produced clinical lots within similar time frames and large-scale production was initiated at nearly the same time. Contrary to popular perception, cell culture is not a new vaccine production process. It's been around for about 25 years and does not save substantial time when it comes to producing influenza vaccine. It does not produce a safer or more effective vaccine and does not necessarily increase yields, which was a critical variable this year. The production of an influenza vaccine involves many steps, many of which are the same regardless of the technology or medium used. For example, growing antigen on any medium can only begin after the seed virus is isolated and is sent to manufacturers by CDC. Finally, no matter which production method is used, all vaccines must undergo rigorous quality control and safety testing. This testing accounts for approximately 85 percent, and I repeat, 85 percent of the production time. This year, Sanofi Pasteur faced the unprecedented and complex challenge of producing two influenza vaccines simultaneously. I am proud of the work of our people, that our people have done in ensuring that Sanofi Pasteur will not only meet its commitment to deliver 75 million H1N1 doses to HHS, but also meet its promise to deliver all 50 million doses of seasonal vaccine to its customers before the peak of the annual flu season. It is important to note that while we still have a long, very long flu season ahead of us. Again, it is a credit to all involved that we have been able to respond as well as we have to this pandemic. 
While it is important and appropriate to discuss where improvements can be made, I believe it is equally important to recognize the accomplishments. Mr. Chairman, thank you again for allowing me the opportunity to testify, and I look forward to any questions. Thank you. Dr. Lakey. Chairman Stupak, Chairman uh, Fallone, and members, Ranking Member Walden, my name is David Lakey. I'm the Commissioner of the Texas Department of State Health Services, and it is an honor to be here today. I I've been in this position for, for three years and had the opportunity to uh, serve in multiple public health events, including Hurricanes Dolly, Ike, and, and Gustav. My, my background is that I'm an infectious disease physician uh, trained in both pediatric and adult in infectious disease. And like members that have testified earlier, I have been affected by this. I was the first state health officer to be infected, and my family was also, was also in infected. History has taught us that pandemics occur, that the challenge is the timing and severity of the next pandemic, with the last one being 40 years ago. State and federal governments have planned and exercised their plans over many years. The challenge in 2009 was that this pandemic was significantly different than the high severity pandemic that many of us had planned for. And it also occurred in our continent, and therefore we were having to respond as we were also figuring out this disease and defining its severity. Because of these differences, our state and nation as a whole had to rapidly flex our plans to match this situation. And this ability to adjust your plans according to what you see is a critical component to any successful rep response. And this flexing of our plans include, included modifying our plans related to the, the distribution of the novel H1N1 vaccine. Previous pandemic plans had anticipated a high level, high severity pandemic, and many of those had focused on mass vaccination clinics. However, mass vaccination clinics have many challenges as, as I have listed in the information that I've given you. We've also looked at school-based clinics, and they have their own challenges, like I've listed in the information that I've provided. And so the, both of those strategies have significant challenges. In light of our real world experience, Texas and many other states decided that we needed to adjust these plans related to the severity of this pandemic. We decided to use the private sector and the public health providers, the local health departments, the FQHCs that are in our state as much as possible to direct, to provide the vaccine to the patients that they usually care for. This method allows us to target the vaccine to those priority populations. We've also worked with pharmacies and figured out how we could provide vaccine to pharmacies so they could provide it in, in that private sector. Now, different states are using alternative strategies based on their experience, their public health infrastructure. Public health is structured in many different ways across the United States and the resources and the capabilities that each state had. Uh, in order to facilitate this, Texas had to develop new resources, new tools in order for us to register providers and to pre-identify individuals with, uh, in, within each priority population. And we made that web-based application and linked it to our uh, primary flu information source at www.texasflu.org. Currently, we have 12,600 healthcare providers in Texas that are part of this distribution system. They've registered to receive vaccine. And of those, we've been able to apportion vaccine to 7,000 providers in our state. In order to complement the system, we have worked with 211 in order to address concerns from healthcare providers or from the general public in order to steer them to where we can find vaccine. Due to the limited supply that has been discussed today, states have had to further adjust these plans to help ensure that the most vulnerable individuals are protected. Uh, for example, Texas so far has been allocated 3.7 million doses. Of that, we've been able to order 3.3 million doses. However, that's the amount of vaccine that we were told that we would have available back a month ago in mid-October. Uh, because of the limited supplies, we've had to target our populations based on risk and the type of vaccine that was available, and then gradually expand those groups as additional vaccine became available to us. I've outlined the, the system for the distribution of vaccine to providers in the state of Texas and the information that I've provided you. I note that once the, the FDA approves and release, releases a lot, uh, the CDC informs the states about the amount and the type of vaccine that is available, and then a lot of additional work has to take place. We have to match the providers that we know that want vaccine with the vaccine that is available, ensure that they still want that vaccine, and make sure that they're ready to accept that vaccine. 
Uh, it is a challenge to match the current priority groups and to the providers that these populations serve. And we also have to ensure that we have good geographic distribution across a large state like, like Texas. Uh, this can be a complicated and a tedious process. We have been adjusting our plans as we have gone through this event, and recently we adjusted our plans to ensure that 20 percent of all the allocation that came to our state went to the local health department so they could fill in the gaps that that private provider base was not supplying. I'd like to finish my time by mentioning several of the challenges that we in state public health have faced as part of this pandemic. And note this pandemic only occurred seven months ago, and has been noted here, a lot of work has taken place across the United States in that relatively short amount of time. Furthermore, all this work was accomplished in a background of significant reductions in public health across the United States. We estimate approximately 15,000 public health positions have been eliminated over the last year across the United States. Now, despite this success, there is a national perception that we are falling short, partly because I believe we set expectations too high about the amount of vaccine that would be available initially, and the national supply hasn't been adequate to meet the public demand that was created. Additionally, we created the perception that vaccine would be available to all priority groups immediately. Uh, these priority groups account for almost half of the U.S. population. And because of the supply limitations, we as a state then had to narrow down those priority groups in order to get the best use of that limited resource. There's also confusion about that process of how vaccines are allocated, ordered, and shipped, and the steps that go into ensuring it gets to the individuals that need it. And there's differences between how the states manage that because of the different structures within public health in their state. These misperceptions have led to false impressions that states are either not pulling down their full allotment or, second, that they're not being allotted the amount that should be according to their population. And both of those impressions are false. There is also a challenge in developing tools to link individuals that are seeking vaccine with the providers that have the vaccine. And various tools have been developed, including web-based tools, uh, but there's challenges with those tools that the providers that are that we're shipping doses to may only receive a small amount of vaccine. And if we put their name on a web page, we may steer a lot of individuals to those sites and give another false impression that vaccine would be available. And I think that would compound the, the current challenges that we are having. Instead of doing that, we in the state of Texas have worked with 211 and provided them a list of the providers. And have steered uh, ind individuals to 211, and then we can give individual guidance on where they can seek vaccine in their, in their community. And we've also, as I noted earlier, sent additional vaccine to the local health providers. Please we also summarize. Have a Please summarize. Okay. Uh, we, I, I think we also have a, a challenge related to the health, public health has been funded, and that's been alluded to earlier to today, the intermittent nature in which some of the funds have come down, one-time funding, and that's been difficult. But I'd like to say thank you for the funds that have been ma made available through the Public Health Emergency Response Funds uh, this last year. Those have been very important. And, and finally, I'd like to say that we really appreciate the commitment of the CDC and the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response for how they've engaged local and state public health. We have continuous dialogue with them in order to in work out issues and figure out how we can best serve the population of the United States. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Dr. Levy, your testimony. Thank you, Chairman Stupak, Chairman uh, Pallone, Ranking Member Walden, and Mr. Green. Um, thank you for this opportunity to speak to you today about our preparation and response to the 2009 H1N1 pandemic. I'm here on behalf of Trust for America's Health a nonprofit, nonpartisan advocacy organization dedicated to saving lives by making disease prevention a national priority. While I understand that today's hearing is a result of considerable frustration with the current H1N1 vaccination program, I want to emphasize four critical points. First, the public health system at all levels of government has moved with remarkable speed in approving an H1N1 vaccine and getting vaccines to as many Americans as supply has permitted. We've moved as fast as or faster than any other country in the world. Second, the vaccine is well matched to the circulating virus. It has been proven to be safe and effective in clinical trials and offers the best possible protection against the disease. Third, whatever our concerns with production capacity are today, had the federal government not made the multi-billion dollar investment in enhanced vaccine production capacity since 2005, we would be in far worse shape. The limits on supply we are experiencing are the limits imposed by the science and technology. The decision to use a central purchasing and distribution approach has assured that as supply has become available, it has been equitably distributed across the nation. 
And finally, the federal government has been remarkably transparent with the American people with, about this pandemic since it began last spring. Public health officials have leveled with the American people, making appropriate adjustments and recommendations as our understanding of the nature of the pandemic has evolved and as supply issues have arisen. The response to this pandemic has mobilized all levels of government. While the federal government has assumed responsibility for distributing vaccines to state and local health departments, each locality is then responsible for developing its own policies and systems for administration of the vaccine. This has posed a number of challenges, particularly in a context of vaccine shortages. First, local health officials received constantly shifting information about how much vaccine would be available and when. This is clearly an issue that has not only created confusion among the American people, it has also made the job of local health officials far more difficult. Second, the largest mass vaccination campaign in U.S. history is taking place when state and local health departments are experiencing devastating losses because of the recession. While the federal government has rapidly pumped almost $1.5 billion to state and local health departments for pandemic response, this does not address the underlying decline in the core capacity of health departments. And third, public confusion may well have been exacerbated by the fact that each state and locality has determined how to distribute its supply once received from the federal government. Although each health department based their plans on a larger supply of vaccine, HHS may want to revisit this issue and consider some standardization in future emergencies. It is our hope that this hearing will contribute to the public's understanding of the complexities of the current pandemic influenza vaccine campaign. Among the key initiatives TIFA maintains are critical to the success of the response to this and future ep epidemics are First, an education campaign is needed to assure the, the American people about the safety and effectiveness of influenza vaccines and all vaccines in general. It is important to remind Americans that even with the delays in vaccine availability, they should get vaccinated as soon as they can. We have not seen the end of this pandemic. FDA should move forward in assessing new technologies that are already in use in other countries, including the use of adjuvants and cell-based vaccines. However, to have moved forward on an, on an expedited basis without the standardized review would probably have undermined an already fragile confidence in the vaccine system. Congress and the administration should also come to a consensus on what is an appropriate level of investment in new technologies. This pandemic has demonstrated that the nation still has a long way to go, not just in vaccine technology, but with regard to diagnostics and antiviral treatments, as well as personal protection equipment. The Biological Advanced Research and Development Agency has been chronically underfunded since its inception. Its, its support is critical to moving promising developmental technologies into mass production. Professional estimates suggest that BARDA needs an annual appropriation of $1.7 billion rather than the current $275 million to achieve its mission. We need to provide ongoing support to state and local health departments in building capacity to respond to public health emergencies. Just as we don't fund fire departments at the moment a fire breaks out, we must move away from emergency funding mechanisms to respond to public health emergencies. This is one reason TIFA supports the mandatory funding for core public health functions that is part of the House Health Reform Bill. Finally, Congress and the administration should assure replenishment of the strategic national stockpile for supplies that have been distributed to states such as N95 respirators, surgical masks, and antivirals. We do not know what demand a future wave of this pandemic strain will require of the SNS, nor can we forget the potential for other pandemic strains emerging, such as the H5N1 bird flu that is of primary concern until last spring. This pandemic has shown both has shown our government at its best and highlighted many of the ongoing weaknesses in our public health system. As we continue to ramp up our response to this pandemic, we must also take steps necessary to assure that when the next public health crisis occurs, a stronger system is in place and capable of responding quickly, effectively, and nimbly. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, and th thank you all for your testimony. Uh, Dr. Narasim, how do you say your last name? Narasim. Narasim. Let me ask you about uh, November 3rd. You signed a letter back to us, to the committee. We asked a number of questions of all the companies, the, the four or five companies here. And, and the one that had caught my eye was on, found on page three, uh, point number five. You said, while the government ordered bulk doses of our proprietary adjuvant, MF59, which enhances the potency of the flu vaccine and based on recently available data, could have quadrupled the number of doses supplied the government ultimately determined that the use of adjuvant was not warranted to combat the pan pandemic and elected not to license or use the emergency use authorization. These are a number of the questions I asked the previous panel. Um, 
to, to my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, do other countries use your MF-59 uh, uh, doses, which the adjuvant in it? That's correct. Uh, we, we have an H1, two H1N1 vaccines licensed in Europe and in other parts of the world with MF-59, and we're exclusively uh, supplying adjuvanted vaccines outside the United States. Okay. Is there a, a safety issue with, with, the, with the, I think the FDA said they had not approved it, and if my memory serves me correctly, you've been trying to get this approved in the U.S. since about 2007? Uh, the MF-59 is not approved in the U.S., but we ha we've licensed it in Europe in 1997. Uh, we have a pretty broad range of clinical studies now, uh, uh, up to 200,000 subjects in non-controlled trials and about 40,000 subjects in controlled clinical studies. And, uh, you know, to date, we have not seen any significant safety signals. So we've continued to provide that data to FDA on an ongoing basis. Okay. Well, no, my 15 years here have always been on drug companies, make sure these things are, are safe. You said it's been licensed since 97 in the rest of the world? That's correct, in the elderly. And then we, we and for this H1N1 now, we have it licensed down to six months of age. So it, for the H1N1, the adjuvanted vaccines overseas are licensed from six months through, through the elderly. Okay. I, I thought I heard Dr. Um, uh, Goodman at the last panel indicate that he, they've ordered a stockpile of this MF-59 from your company. That is correct. We're maintaining a stockpile in Louisville, Kentucky. And I asked him then, when were they going to use it? When do we get to the point where, whether it's adjuvant or not, we're going to use it because the pandemic is so great here in the United States? Have they ever discussed that with you? We, we had a discussion with them in early May as to how to how to proceed, and the decision at that point was to only use licensed platforms, U.S. licensed platforms, moving forward. Through the summer and into September, we've maintained the capability to always use the adjuvant in case the clinical data suggested that was needed. Uh, we continue to, to stand ready to do that, but to date, and we also have prepared the EUA application uh, in collaboration with HHS, but we've, we have not been asked to date to, to move forward with that. Okay. Um, I think in your testimony you said you started discussing this 2007, whether you should adjuvant or not, with the FDA in 2007. You applied for a license in 2008. Is that, is that correct? We, we applied for a, a new drug application, an IND, an investigational new drug, okay. in, in 2008. And uh, we've been going back and forth with, with the FDA uh, since then. Do you see this, uh, the adjuvant issue, that, that just won't be with uh, H1N1, but really any kind of a vax, vaccine, isn't it? Because you can quadruple, at least in this case, at least quadruple your doses? It, that's correct. I mean, there's, there's a number of benefits from the adjuvant. One is you improve the immunogenicity so that if you have children or the elderly who don't respond, you can actually make them respond to the vaccine. You can increase the number of doses. Another valuable thing of the adjuvant, which was not as relevant in this case, is if the virus changes. So in the spring, if the virus changes, there might be the need to revaccinate everyone in, in the U.S., whereas with the adjuvant, you can cover a certain amount of variation in the virus we've seen in our clinical studies. Now, we haven't looked at that yet in this case, but it would at least provide you that flexibility. Uh, Dr. Levy, is it fair to ask you, uh, is, is it fair to say that this is something we ought to look at as a country? I mean, the FDA has licensed it. I, I know you mentioned uh, in your testimony about making sure drugs safe and approved, and that's my concern. I'm sure everyone's concerned on this panel. Uh, are we missing something here? Is it something we should look at closer? Oh, it's definitely something we should look at closely, and I, I believe the FDA is doing this in a good faith manner. I think, you know, when you think about who we are targeting for this vaccine, the bulk of the data for using the adjuvanted vaccine occurs with the elderly. That's not who's targeted in this vaccine. And so we're just beginning to get the kind of data that you would be associated with kids. And I, but I think the larger question is we have so much vaccine hesitancy in this country, so much inaccurate knowledge about whether vaccines are safe and particularly whether this vac uh, flu vaccine is safe, sure. to add on through an emergency use applica uh, application um, a new element that may indeed be safe could, pro could well have undermined the efficacy of this campaign. Mm -hmm. So this one's been around for, as, as I said, I think 97 or so uh, and been approved. It, w would it be prudent to maybe leave the decision to the parent whether or not they wanted their child to be vaccinated with an H1N1 vaccine that's rejuvenated as opposed to a not? 
it, it, it is sometimes hard to understand why there is so much hesitancy around vaccines in general and this right. particular vaccine. I think we had a real public health question as to whether people would accept a vaccine right. that had a new product in it. Now, if things had been worse and this had been a much more severe pandemic, we may have needed to go that way anyway because whatever risk around hesitancy might have been overcome by fear of the virus itself, but I don't think that's where we are. I do believe that we need to move expeditiously in preparation for any future pandemic to be able to better address these questions about adjuvants and, um, and other technologies. Okay, my, my time's up. Uh, Mr. Walden, for questions, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I, uh, for those of us who don't spend our lives in the world you're in, could somebody give me like a 20-second explanation of an adjuvant? Doctor. Sure. The uh, adjuvants have actually been used in vaccines in, in the United States since the 1920s. There's one called alum that's been used extensively. Uh, adjuvants, you might pull that mic a little oh, sorry. closer. Adjuvants yeah. are, are actually um, additives that we put in the vaccine that actually boost the immune response. So in, in this case, what we would do is we'd make the vaccine as we normally would make it, add in the, the adjuvant, and then see how the vaccine performs. And typically, a lot less vaccine is needed and, and the immune response is higher. And, and in your clinical trials overseas, you, you, did I hear you say correctly that you haven't seen any adverse response, well, maybe not any adverse response, you always have some, but nothing out of the, the band you would in, look at? In our clinical trials, and I also just wanted to correct, we have now 25,000 subjects that are non-elderly. So it's not that we don't have data in elderly, we have quite a robust data set in the, in the non-elderly population. Um, we only see, uh, we see reactions comparable to seasonal vaccine uh, for adverse events. And, and when in 08 did you apply to FDA for approval? We did not apply, uh, just to clarify, we did not apply for approval. The first step is to file an IND, and, and so we filed for the IND, which would then allow us to take the steps okay. to file for the approval. Our intention, is, our intention has been to use our European data to try to, to try to move forward. The question always has been how much data needs to be repeated in the U.S. Right. than done in Europe. And, and when in 08 did you uh, do the first step? I, I could get back to him in the exact date. I think it was mid-08. And, and what else? do you hear from FDA that you need to supply that you haven't? I think they, they would like to see adequately controlled, randomized studies under FDA oversight that demonstrate the safety and, and benefit of, of the vaccine. We have a lot of data, a lot of it's, most of it's been generated not under FDA over, under, oversight with EMEA, European oversight, and the question for us as a company is how much of this can we realistically be expected to repeat and, and, of course, with flu vaccines being as profitable or not as profitable yeah. as they are. Or as profitable the as they are, <laughs> which is to say they're not. Yeah. Um, okay. So going back then, um, uh, well, let me, let me run this on out. I mean, uh, if this were the feared avian flu that we had hearings on and the potential of four out of every ten dying because of it, um, I guess we would declare some sort of emergency and take whatever risk there is, but if you're, if you're using this uh, MF-59 in Europe and you're not seeing any real problems, um, I just wonder what it would take here to get going on that. What's, what, what does FDA tell? We should ask FDA more, yeah, I, I mean, guess. I, I, you can't, did I can't speak for, for the agency. I mean, my understanding is if, if the severity was such or if the unadjuvanted vaccines had not worked, then right. they would have looked at this much more seriously. With H5N1, it's very difficult to get the unadjuvanted vaccines to work. So hence, the MF59 becomes, uh, adjuvants in general, become much more important. In this case, because they had an unadjuvanted vaccine that, that worked, I think they were more reluctant to, to move with the adjuvant. And I would say that HHS and BARDA has funded a lot of our work with adjuvants. So the U.S. government has supported a lot of the work that we've done. But, but looking at from where you are today with the FDA, what kind of timeline do you think you and the FDA are on? And I realize they're your regulator and approver and you have to, you know, be really nice here. But um, I don't mean to put you on the spot. Just, just for my sake, the public's sake, what, what kind of timeline? The way, the way we look at this is we have an H1N1 adjuvanted, we have a seasonal adjuvanted, we have an H5N1 adjuvanted. Our goal is to get one or all, ideally all of these licensed as, as soon as possible. And, you know, we would be willing, of course, to file as soon as we can find a pathway with FDA that makes sense. But I think we would be unwilling to repeat large clinical studies and, and incur all the costs again 
if, if that's what's ultimately going to be required, unless, unless the government helped us. Yeah. Are, are, are we the only country that doesn't allow the adjuvant? In our vaccines? At, at, least, at least for Novartis, the only country that we do not supply adjuvanted vaccines to is the United States. All right. So if I could, if I could just comment. Yeah, so go ahead. Um, CSL has a unique adjuvant as well that we developed in Australia. Um, and we did put it into the H5N1 that we supplied to Australia during uh, that time frame uh, a few years ago. And H5N1 is what? Refresh That's the bird flu, okay. the avian flu. Got it. Uh, we also have multiple research programs going on with um, partner companies uh, who are developing vaccines uh, utilizing our adjuvant. And this adjuvant is being manufactured in Kankakee, Illinois. So uh, we so have we manufactured here, we just can't use it here. It's being used in clinical trials with new vaccines that are being developed by other yeah. companies that we partner with. And as you've used it in other countries, if I understood you correctly. We've done the studies uh, for what, H5N1 uh, in, the other, in Australia. And did you find any we outlier found it effects? We safe and efficacious. Okay. We're also able to produce MF59 in the Holly Springs facility, and we expect the MF59 suite in Holly Springs, North Carolina, to be operational uh, in December. All right. My, my time has expired. I know we have other members here who want to ask questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to the panel. Mr. Chairman Bloom. Thank you. I was going to ask, uh, use my time with Dr. Lakey here because you're the state guy. And um, I don't know if you were here when I asked the first panel, but all my questions were about distribution and also about funding because Dr. Lori brought it up. Um, Basically, you know that CDC has, has left it up to the states to decide how to distribute the vaccine. Um, so I wanted to know how a state decides which entities will distribute vaccine, uh, you know, how many doses they receive, and essentially do you agree with the CDC that these decisions should be left to the states, or should they be dictated by the federal government maybe a little more strictly? I mean, I know they have guidelines, but, you know, I, I don't know if you were here before, but I've been getting you know, all these criticisms in New Jersey about the Wall Street firms getting the, you know, the, the vaccine because they can distribute it better or, you know, than some other places. So, you know, and we're hearing in my own state of New Jersey and in New York about, you know, major disparities. One school district versus another gets it. One gets it, the other doesn't. Well, I just want your response. I mean, I know you're a state official, so you probably think states are great, but I'd just like your response. Sure. Let, let me um, provide some background related to how we, we do this. Uh, we have the ACIP guidelines of, of the high risk groups, and then those were further prioritized into a group from taking it from 159 million to, to 40, and about 49 million. And so that the, the challenge for us has been the, the changing landscape and how much vaccine is going to be available, because your strategy to deliver vaccine changes depending on how much vaccine you have. You can't run a mass vaccination clinic if you only have 100 doses. And you can't provide a school-based clinic if you're not immunizing healthy young kids. And so states looked at those priority groups, and, and I think most states looked at healthcare workers, pregnant women, and very young kids as those top individuals that we needed to start our immunization program with. The challenge was that the first vaccine that was available was the nasal spray, and so we couldn't immunize pregnant women with the nasal spray, and so we had to wrap And just to interrupt you, I've had that phenomenon too, where, you know, one of my school districts has the nasal spray yes. but doesn't have the vaccine, and they want the vaccine instead of the nasal spray. Yes, yes. And, and so it's a, a matching of the vaccine that you have available with your priority groups and your distribution system. What, what systems do you have available? And so a, a lot of us state health officials tried to move from large vaccination clinics to using the private sector. And, you know, it's one of the challenges with the large... So you use the state, you use employers as well, the way New York does? We're not using... Well, we're, we're providing it to the physicians, the, the health care systems, um, so you don't actually, I know I'm interrupting you, but I'm running out of time. You don't actually do like what New York has done, or maybe New York City has done, where they would go to large employers like Citigroup or Goldman Sachs that have health clinics and have them do the distribution. I have 13,000 registered providers on our, our system, and it's a combination of many uh, of those. There may be some occupational health, but, but that's the minority. The most of these are 
pediatricians, OBGYN, uh, family practitioners in, in the state. Would you, do you think that, uh, I mean, I, now I'm asking you to criticize another state, but I mean, would you, uh, New York obviously uses some of these large employers. Do you think does that makes sense? Well, I don't know the details know, of, of, of New York. I, from what I have gathered is that they've been trying to meet the, the priority groups and, and trying to reach pregnant women in different yeah. ways that they could do it. But I cannot speak for the state health officers with it. All right, let me issue this. You, you did mention the challenges of uh, intermittent public health funding. Yes, and and um, Dr. Lurie brought up funding challenges. I was a little critical because I don't remember the secretary mentioning that when she was here. And of course, you know, if you need money, this is the place to come mm -hmm. uh, for the most part these days. Um, w talk to me a little bit about that. I mean, to what extent the lack of funding or intermittent nature of it has been a problem? Sure. I, I think there's a couple of, of issues here. One is the, the federal funds that have been made available. You know, after 9-11, a lot of funds were made available. It, it peaked, and then it gradually declined. And so we receive now probably about half of, of what we were receiving earlier on. Uh, we also had, in, in 2006, uh, one-time funding related to pandemic flu. And so that money was, was utilized to put together plans. Um, but you can't can't hire people for long term on one time funding. And so that, that funding went away. Uh, those plans were, were made. Um, but you can't continue that process after those funds have went away. But you obviously feel that it makes sense for the states to have a lot of discretion here. In other words, you wouldn't suggest that the federal guidelines be um, strengthened or, or made more detailed at this point. You, you believe the state should have the leeway to pretty much do what they want? pursuant to the existing guidelines? I guess the clarification, that, that's for the, the folks that are being vaccinated right now, the, the guidelines? For In terms of the distribution. The distribution system. I think where we are right now, folks are titrating up those, those groups. I think they based that on their capacity as a state. Uh, what were the resources? What was their history with delivering vaccine? And then they, they used those systems. Uh, and so you have public health is structured many different ways across our the, the United States, uh, and they used that uniqueness of their system, who they could reach the, the quickest in order to determine their priority groups, using the, the same basic philosophy, trying to get pregnant women, young kids, healthcare workers from the beginning, but then how they massaged that and adjusted that was de dependent on what that state system was. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Shimkus, for questions, please. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you for the, the panelists for being here. You know, we've spent a lot of time on adjuvant and how it boosts this, but I want to focus a little bit on this, uh, the nasal spray. And so, Dr. McKelsey, I know in your written and opening statement, you mentioned this, the, I guess it's intranasal technology uh, and the ability to get a 180 to 100 versus one through seven doses. Can you explain that to us and why that's, uh, I mean, if we're talking about needing a lot of doses from the uh, layman's point of view, it sounds like a, uh, a good thing to be uh, focusing on. Yeah, um, I can explain that. Um, I think there are two reasons uh, for, for that. One is, um, I think we at Metamune, we develop our own seed strain and using the reverse genetics, we can quickly screen multiple variants of, of the vaccine and select for growth properties, immunogenicity. So for instance, uh, for the H1N1 vaccine, we basically um, screened 23 variants and uh, did not lose any time and we were in commercial production at scale on July 3rd. Um, I think the, the other important factor is, is so we, we were able to actually immediately create an H1N1 strain which produces as much as we have seen in the past. And then the other advantage of the live attenuated technology is actually you spray it in the nose. You have uh, the virus replicates there and creates a immune response. So if you compare it to the inactivated vaccine, you, you need a very, very small dose. Maybe uh, if you compare it from a, let's call it quantitative uh, factor 50 lower. So uh, I think that is uh, a very important at attribute um, to actually you consider this technology as part of pandemic preparedness. Um, I can tell you we, uh, 
we have manufactured over 100 million bulk doses and um, we could easily have gone up to 200 million doses um, by bulk doses by the end of this year. And, and I, I, what, I'm, what piqued my interest is also some of the comments uh, when um, Chairman Pallone got into the discussion a little bit and, and the nasal um, spray issue uh, is not for pregnant women, but but there's a, a lot of other, I mean, the other two groups, there would be no prohibition yeah. for them. Is that true? That, that's correct. Um, so I think he mentioned a school that didn't want to do nasal yeah. spray. I think that uh, we are not, you know, we are, do not have pregnant women in our label, and we cannot administer uh, the intranasal spray to that population. But uh, the majority of the risk population is covered by the by the intranasal vaccine. So I think what's also very important is that there is enough education to actually objectively. Uh, make people aware of the choices available in, in the flu vaccination technology. Uh, because maybe people now react on the intranasal vaccine, but there may be the same fear factor for the adjuvanted vaccine. And I, I think those, uh, those assumptions in the public could be avoided by a targeted education campaign where it is emphasized that the safety and efficacy of, of the general vaccines available in the U.S. is, is, is good. Thank you. Dr. Lakey, I, and the, the title of the hearing is an update on vaccine production and distribution. And when I initially read that, I always think distribution is can the drug get from point A to point B? Uh, I think what a better uh, title for this would have been in the, the decision-making matrix of, of who gets it, not, I, for me, the di there's no distribution problem as far as you see if, of when this is produced to a delivery to an endpoint user, is there? For the most part, no. I mean, there is, um, so, so that is in the private sector. It is uh, manufactured, it is, you know, we order it and it is shipped. Um, that system seems to work for the most part. There have been weather events, et cetera, that, that have uh, slowed that down, but for the most part, that distribution system has worked. What else uh, do you think we need to do? Because you, you probably listened to the opening statements. My concern is if we can't get this right, how do we do something? What do we need to do to prepare ourselves better for uh, uh, H5 or uh, something of, that could may turn out to be a bigger problem? Well, I guess I've learned through other events, uh, such as hurricanes, et cetera, that you have to take time afterwards to critically look at what went well and what you could have done better, just learning from your experiences. Uh, I think you, we, there's been good discussion today of what we can do to improve the availability of a vaccine. Uh, I think making sure that we communicate effectively to individuals real expectations and not set artificially high expectations because I think the general public will respond when we're given the, the right expect, expectations. And, and I agree. My time's expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, panel. Thank you, Mr. Shemkis. Mr. Green, for questions, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and, and uh, Dr. Lakey, I appreciate you being here and Thank glad you. we got to meet earlier and appreciate what you've done for three years as the Commissioner of Health in Texas. And uh, um, I guess one of my interests is on the delivery system, although our big issue here is why we don't have enough vaccines, obviously, and I know you experience it every day. And, in Texas, like a lot of us here from our offices. And, uh, but one of the challenges uh, you mentioned is associated with school-based clinics and vaccinations. And I noticed in today's Houston Chronicle, some of my school districts in the Houston area are actually doing it, uh, A-Leaf, Umble. Um, and I was wondering, are you having any uh, resistance from schools, particularly schools that have school-based clinics, uh, to providing the H1N1 for their students? I think what you see or seeing in Texas is a mosaic of different strategies working together to get individuals immunized. I think some schools, uh, there are school systems that have a lot of experience with school-based clinics, and, and those seem to work. Uh, there are other school systems that haven't done that well, haven't done it in the past. Uh, there, there are some challenges, making sure that you get uh, parental consent, that, you know, that you, so you don't immunize a child that hasn't provided uh, consent, the parents haven't provided consent. And, and other 
um, just logistical challenges. There, there are folks that you have to have there to, to provide immunizations, et cetera. Uh, we are using some of the funds that were provided uh, by, by Congress to be able to hire individuals to allocate that. Um, but all those things have to come to, um, together. So that's one part of our system. We're able to do that now in, in Texas because as we've titrated up the number of groups, you know, we've been reaching the, the high risk in the individuals, uh, you know, the, the children with asthma, et cetera. And so we're now able to expand out to some of the healthy kids um, in our state. Okay. Can you tell us how public emer health uh, emergency funds uh, help you and other state public health departments set up and operate the H1N1 program. Excuse me again, sir. How the, uh, the, how the public health emergency funds that you receive sure. help with that? Yeah, the, the, the public health emergency funds came in three components, and they've been critical to our ability to, to respond. Uh, the, the first part had to do with getting uh, surveillance systems. Again, public health has been, been, been cut, and so having feet on the ground in order to investigate cases, figure out whether this H1 or not, uh, that, that's been critical to hire those individuals. Uh, we've been able to uh, improve our laboratory capacity, having the, the individuals in the laboratory to process samples, uh, that has been a critical component uh, of our, our system. Uh, we've been able to develop uh, the vaccine ordering system um, in, in order to, to make sure that, that we have that technology in order to, to accomplish this. Uh, about 80. One percent of the, the funds that came in, uh, Public Health Emergency Response 3, we sent out to the local health departments and so that they could hire the individuals to, to be able to respond. Again, there's been significant cuts at the local level in public health. A lot of those public health departments are shrinking and, and can't provide those, that investigation, the delivery of vaccine, all those different manpower components uh, without the funds that were allocated in order to hire those individuals. Dr. Levy. Uh I know you released a report on co-authored with American Academy and Pediatrics states that school-aged children are, are, are the population most responsible for transmission of influenza and has the highest rate of attack. And there's a, that report also cites in 2005 a school-based pilot program in the state of Maryland where flu mist was administered to children in several Maryland secondary and elementary schools. And the results were that the program showed significant reduction in respiratory illnesses within households of children who receive these vaccines versus schools that do not participate. It seems like that report, and I'm sure there's others, proof that shows school-based uh, facilities, of course with the parents' permission, uh, but that making it available to parents is, is a successful way to deliver that. Absolutely, and certainly using school-based facilities for both immunizations and other types of health care are critically important. That's why there are some major provisions in the health reform legislation that would expand that capacity. Um, this is a tremendous opportunity to reach, reach kids. And, you know, a lot of our pan pandemic planning assumed that kids would be not, would not, that, you know, it would be more like seasonal flu and the elderly would be most vulnerable, as it turned out. Uh, young kids were the most vulnerable, and so having, if we had a strengthened school-based clinic and immunization program, we'd certainly be in better shape today. Okay. Mr. Chairman, I appreciate the, but my last question, actually for the reason we're here today, and it's asked our production, our producers of the vaccination. Um, I know there's been a lot of discussion regarding benefits of new technologies and to produce uh, flu vaccines and the cell culture is the newest one, but I understand that there's no difference. We wouldn't be producing faster vaccines using cell as compared to the eggs. And if each of you, as brief as you could, respond to that, is there something we could do that would make it quicker, whether it's eggs or the cell? I think, you know, cell culture is not a game changer. I think I'll steal that, that phrase from, from Tony Fauci. Uh, the game changer probably is really something along the lines of a universal flu vaccine, which you could stockpile. It covers all different variants of flu strains over, over the course of seasons. However, that's a long ways away. Uh, in terms of saving time, whether it's cells or eggs, you're again dealing with mother nature. You have to adapt the virus to the system that you're utilizing. And perhaps with cells, maybe you save a, a two or three weeks. But in terms of of capacity and overall production capacity, I don't think that it's really a game changer. You'll get virus out there, about the, uh, vaccine out there at about the same time. In fact, the two facilities that we have based in the U.S., um, uh, we have they, they have the 
potential to produce 150 million trivalent seasonal doses. If you convert that to a monovalent, that's 450 million doses of an H1N1 type vaccine. So there's plenty of capacity right here on U.S. soil with the two, two new facility, the one new facility and our existing facility. What we really need to, to look at is why aren't we immunizing as many people as we should be immunizing on a seasonal basis? When 36,000 people die every year and 200,000 people are hospitalized, um, we have recommendations from the ACIP that 275 million people should be immunized on an annual basis. We're lucky to immunize 100 million people. If you want to sustain influenza immunization, production, development of new technologies, we really need to make sure we get more people immunized for the benefit of public health and for sustaining our manufacturing capabilities. Okay. So the capacities here, whether it's production in the United States or, and I know we have one production in Australia, which is fine, but we have the capacity to produce 400 million vaccine well, well, for I, H1N1? I, I, think, I think there's an important, important uh, dynamic here. So for this vaccine, but what we saw with the avian influenza is that a un, an unadjuvanted 15 microgram dose was not sufficient. In fact, many manufacturers saw it took 90 micrograms, right, which was six times as much, which means the supply collapses. Mm -hmm. And so as the only manufacturer here that actually produces cell culture-based vaccines, we actually have two licensed cell culture vaccines now in Europe. We're producing it uh, for Europe, unadjuvanted and adjuvanted, uh, seasonal and pandemic. And, you know, what our, our belief is with, with cell culture is you, you get some speed gain. You know, our, our expectation, a little different view, is that it's on the order of six to eight weeks, but it's not massive. I mean, it's going to be on that range as to the gain you get with cell culture. But as, as Dr. Michelezzi also mentioned, with reverse genetics and, and using some new technologies, cell culture allows you to actually meet the need of many of the changing viruses that are out there. And the worst case scenario for the American public is you rely on a single technology that technology doesn't work when it's a different influenza strain, and then suddenly you have a, a real crisis on your hands. So I think it's a wise strategy to invest in multiple different technologies, simply because we don't know how any one virus will behave. Okay, quickly, because uh, again, Mr. Burgess, we're going to have votes here soon. Um, for us, you know, the eggs are, are working well, but I, I think if you can have the cell culture technology also available, it de-risks de the supply in the fact that if you have a really bad avian flu going around, it may affect the supply of eggs and those kind of things. I think the scalability of, of cell culture technology is, is very critical. And I think especially if you think about the life attenuated flu technology, we have a facility in Frederick, Maryland with two 2,500 liter bioreactors with the cell culture flu intranasal technology, we could manufacture half a, mil half a billion doses in that facility. And if you think about the cost efficiencies you could generate, um, I think the cell culture at scale could be a very interesting asset uh, and, and guarantee or further uh, guarantee supply of flu vaccine. Thank you. Mr. Burgess, for questions before you start, I should mention that uh, you're one of the members that had written to myself and Chairman Plone and asked for this hearing and along with other members, but we appreciate it. And uh, we'll start with the questions. You're kind to point out that I didn't whine. Uh, and, you know, you just finished up on an, on an excellent point, Dr. Uh, Mike Levitt came and testified here in, I guess it was 2005. It was going to be very, very difficult to develop the number of eggs that would be needed to produce the vaccines if we'd called all our chickens the month before. Um, let me just ask a couple of questions of all four of our manufacturers, and, and uh, I'd appreciate brief answers, but when in this, this sort of the timeline that's been going on since last April, when, when did you find out about the, what, the delay? When, when did, it, uh, did you really appreciate we were a month behind? Well, I'll respond first. Uh, I think that uh, we did not, because we did not participate in the pandemic uh, RFP that was put out by the U.S. government a couple of years ago, our contract was a bit different. So we, we started the negotiation in May and finished in May, which is the fastest I've ever done a government contract, by the way, mm -hmm. um, which was, was quite, quite nice to see. Uh, and we had to submit at that time our schedule uh, that we assumed based on average yields uh, when we signed the contract. Uh, within three weeks, we could see that the virus was not growing well. So we started at the beginning of June, uh, and we could see that the seed strains that we had were not uh, developing in fact, they were a half to a third of what we had expected. And again, we, our expectations were set on 10 years of seasonal assays. 
But as all of the manufacturers here will tell you, each new flu season is a new flu season. Right. Uh, you just can't tell, and I think you have a medical background as well, uh, or physician, so you, you understand that. But I think that we knew right away. We had weekly conference calls with HHS and BARDA, and we informed them and put a new delivery schedule together in so July. So you, you did communicate through conference calls? Yes, we did. And that would be in June? Uh, we communicated in June and then put a new delivery schedule together in July and based on our assumptions. What was Novartis' experience? Uh, with Novartis, we, we saw the reduced yields in, in July. And I, I just would point out, for clarity's sake, we actually can't confirm yields until we receive FDA reagents. And those reagents were really made available in August. But with initial testing, we saw the reduced yields in July. We communicated our, our, our situation weekly with HHS, um, as, as did all the manufacturers. Well, metamine is different, but what about Sanofi? What? So actually just the same for us in terms of uh, realizing that uh, we first started out on a very conservative estimate uh, in terms of, of yield of the virus, and it actually was about 60 percent of what we thought it was going to be, even on a conservative number. And we had weekly phone calls uh, with BARDA HHS, and schedules were revised all throughout the way uh, periodically as we gained new information. Well, I'm, I'm a little concerned because I had some conversations in August with CDC and NIH and, and was given assurances that when school started, we would be well on our way to having, uh, depending upon the, the approval process, well on our way to having satisfactory doses by mid-October. And that was kind of the timeline that I was, that I was laboring under. Let me, uh, let me ask you a question. In, uh, in uh, the end of October, uh, Secretary Sebelius at a Senate hearing uh, said she was going to put out a call to the manufacturers to accelerate production, but I'm going to assume you'd already done so at that point. Is that correct? Was there anything you did differently as a result of, of, of that uh, call? Uh, at CSL, what we did is, uh, when we did receive the call, we took another look at our ability to fill and finish vaccine. Uh, producing the antigen is one piece of it. Then you have to actually get it into a formulation and put it into either vials or syringes. Uh, our manufacturing plants for fill and finish of flu vaccine are inside plants that produce other therapies. So our CSL business includes protein plasma therapies for rare diseases. So we had to adjust our lines and our manpower in order to see if we could free up some manufacturing slots. And you did that Actually, as a result we of did that as, as, a result. A, as a result of the call on October 29th? Uh, we did. We were evaluating all along the way, but that was also a call to reinforce what we had been discussing with BARDA. Let me just ask if any of the manufacturers, was it, was it problematic for you that you were at the point where you were gearing up for the seasonal flu and, and you then suddenly had this uh, H1N1 task added to the, to the equation? I, I think it was just the compression of the timelines. We had to complete our seasonal flu, uh, at least for the case of Novartis, complete our planned seasonal flu doses, which uh, was what uh, we were requested to do. And then we started, in our case, H1N1 in July, which, which obviously brings us to have a very short time frame a short runway to sort of get the plane off off the ground. But still, there's been a there's been difficulty getting seasonal flu vaccine out to. Uh, I know our community has been has been lacking for several weeks. Um, are are we back on schedule with the seasonal flu? Well, in our case, we, we completed our seasonal de deliveries in early October. But I completed them, but we, uh, the house physician here is out. For example, my Walmart back home is out. I, I know I could get the Metamune, and, and and I should do that. But uh, for the for the the other uh, the other vaccine is for, in our area has been harder to come by and I know Dr. Lakey may may know more about what what difficulty we're encountering there. Let me just ask uh, Metamune on the issue of adjuvants. Are there adjuvants that you use with your uh, with your attenuated live virus? Um, we don't use any uh, adjuvants in our because your yield and, and the method of of immunogenicity and is such that it the yield is so yeah, high. It's a live virus and. Um, it basically it replicates in the nasal cavity. You, you, you don't need an adjuvant. Dr. Lakey, let me just... I want to highlight that we, um, we completed our seasonal manufacturing also in time and uh, were able, even able to accelerate it so to free up more manufacturing capacity for H1M1. Dr. Lakey, thank you. Let, Dr. Lakey, let me just ask you, uh, because, yeah, it, uh, Texas has had some problems, and they, some of them made their way into the front page of the newspapers. But when did you learn that Texas was going to be, uh, going to be having some difficulty delivering on the uh, vaccine shipments? Yeah, I, I think we learned as vaccine was coming out that it wasn't what we had anticipated. And so in early 
October, as, as I recollect, it was, it was when we figured out that what we were being told we were going to get was not what uh, we had been, been told in the past. Do you feel that uh, CDC and HHS shared information with you in a, in a timely fashion? We've had multiple calls with, with the, the, the CDC and the Office of the Secretary of Preparedness and, and Response, uh, and they you know, showed predictions, but a lot of them changed pretty quickly. Now, has, uh, have they been helpful in, in, in helping you adapt to the, uh, the change in the vaccine availability? The, the CDC has been very helpful to us in, in the state of, of Texas when, when there have been issues that have been that have arisen. Uh, we have uh, called them individually. We have uh, conference calls two times a week uh, with their leadership to uh, with, with all the state health officers to uh, discuss issues uh, and to have a question and answer time period. And so they have been available and, and have answered questions. And how about the manufacturers themselves? Have they similarly responded with, uh, with information when, when you needed it? Or do, do your communications go directly through CDC? Uh, my, my communication would go through the CDC. The manufacturers would discuss that, that information with the CDC. So there hasn't been a direct conversation between state health, health departments and the, the manufacturers. And uh, you and, and Mr. Pallone talked a little bit about funding. Uh, do you have, you, I get the feeling that the, the level of funding, the 1.5 billion was, was not satisfactory. Do you have an idea in mind of, of what would bring us to a level of funding that would be satisfactory? So, so this is for, for the, the FER funding right now. There's a, the Association of State and Territorial Health Officials talked to uh, state health officers to, to figure out what they think we, we, they would need. Uh, that, that survey thought that about 800 million would, would need to be available in order to continue this response through, through March. Some state health departments are in better shape than, than, than others. Uh, some, I believe about half of them, will, uh, are predicted to run out of their FER funding by the end of the, this year. Um, and, and so you have, again, state health departments are in different situations, but, but the, when we've tried to look at this um, systematically throughout the United States, the, the the number was about $800 million to get all state health departments through the, the end of this pandemic. Now, um, you've indicated to me that you see that the number of cases has actually diminished over what it was even just a few weeks ago, and yet we're coming up to the holiday season between Christmas and uh, Thanksgiving and Christmas. People will be traveling a great deal in this country, and I just remember my days as in, as in the clinics, you'd typically see a great increase in, mm -hmm. in viral syndrome the, around Christmas time and the weeks shortly after. Now, could we anticipate a, a, a resurgence of the number of cases toward the end of the year because of the amount of travel that people are going to be doing? Uh, uh, that is correct. And so as a state, our, we monitor the percentage of visits to physicians that are for influenza-like illness. We peaked in Texas around 13 percent. We've gone down to about 7 percent. But the nature of pandemics is that they occur in waves, and we predict that there will be a, th a third wave. The challenge will be how that third wave corresponds to the seasonal flu. And, you know, do we hit one and then the other, or do you have seasonal flu on top of H1N1, which would be a, a challenge for, for state health departments. And since Mike, I got to wrap her up. It's your uh, just as a final thought, we are, of course, we're right next door to Mexico, which is where this began a year ago. Is there any thought to what might be happening to the, to the evolution of the pandemic in, in Mexico? Will they be on their second or third or fourth wave um, in February or March around the same time frame that this, uh, that this was introduced last year? Yeah, I, I don't know if I can. Uh, intelligent, intelligently answer that. Uh, I, I think we would predict that they are going to have, you know, an additional wave. Uh, I think what we've, you know, one of the, the, the challenges for us uh, is the, you know, is there a correspondence between the severity and social economic factors? And, and so in, in poor areas of our state or in poor countries, do we have more significant disease? And so we're wrestling with that uh, currently. But it definitely impacted us last year when, when, when they became ill, we developed symptoms very quickly in our state. Yeah, it, infectious disease do not respect borders, and it came across our border very rapidly. Uh, and, uh, you know, throughout the, the southern part, of, the, the hardest part of Texas, the, the part of Texas that was hit the hardest was our southern border. Uh, if you look at our fatality rates, uh, et cetera, it's, there's a significant difference of our border versus the rest of our state. Thank you, Doctor. I'll yield back, Mr. Chairman. Well, just in, in summarize, we're going to have votes here in a few minutes, and uh, we'll finish up with this panel and finish up this hearing. Dr. Lakey, it's fair to say we're going to get another wave of this uh, H1N1 
Uh, right now, it seems like we're at a like a calm before the storm. And is that because there's more uh, vaccines out there, or is it what is it? We're going to get hit again, are we not? I'm not sure if it's. You know, there's probably several factors interacting. One, the natural history of pandemics coming in, in waves, uh, and I think that's what we're seeing. And you'll see differences across the United States. Activity is decreasing in Texas. It's in rapidly increasing in other parts of the state, in the New England part, part of the, the, the nation. But the natural history of pandemics is that they occur in, in waves. And so our goal as we vaccinate individuals is that we can blunt that third wave. And that's why it's not too late to immunize individuals, even though this wave is decreasing, that we need to blunt that third wave. So as Mr. Burgess said, as we move about during this holiday season of Thanksgiving and Christmas, that could very well spread it in areas that has not seen the intensity we've seen in other parts okay. of the country. As we get into the colder season, as people are more inside, as the humidity changes, as uh, the environment is more conducive to the spread of infectious diseases, it is likely that there will be additional spread. And then we could very well have the seasonal flu on top of it. Exactly, sir. Okay. Well, let me just ask you all this question and, and just to summarize, it, it's my understanding from listening throughout this hearing that there really was a pretty good cooperation or, or with the government in, in working this one out between communications, coordinations, and even moving some contracts fairly quickly. Is that fair to say? I mean, uh, usually, they're usually on the government, but I mean, it sounds like this time they actually, all the preparedness they've done for a pandemic has actually worked out fairly well. Is, is that fair to say? Uh, you're all nodding your head yes? Okay. Mike, any other question before we close her down? Wrong, wrong I, question I, I, to I ask. Am, I am disturbed because Secretary Sebelius did, did indicate to us that, uh, that we would have the doses that we needed. And again, my calls to the CDC and HHS, although they were off the record in August, yeah, I got the information that they'd studied what was happening in the Southern Hemisphere. It wasn't as bad as what they thought, but there were certain populations that would definitely be at risk. But not to worry, we would have the vaccine done and approved and, and in the hands of the providers, uh, certainly by mid-October. At that point, the fear was, what if it's worse when the school year initiates Correct. of the 1st of September and we have to push this stuff out the door before the clinical trials are finished at the end of September? So I... I, I'm, I'm still uneasy about all of that, that timeline. And I, I, you know, so my, my very first statement of this was when I had that very first conference call, I was worried that we were going to underestimate the severity of, of, of this virus. And uh, I mean, it's just incumbent upon us to constantly stay vigilant and not, not get complacent about our ability to fight it off. There's no doubt we had rosy forecasts from the secretary that has not held true, but I think between the, the low egg production of the virus and uh, condensed timeline and the great demand has probably led to the frustrations that we all feel. And that's the purpose of this hearing to get to it. And uh, I think we learned a lot from this panel and the previous panel. But uh, overall, I think the government cooperation and working together to try to resolve this has been pretty good, probably above par. So with that, let me, let me conclude this hearing. That concludes all questioning. I want to thank all of our witnesses for coming today and for your testimony. The committee rules provide that the members have 10 days to submit additional questions for the record. That concludes our hearing. This joint hearing of the Health and Oversight and Investigation Subcommittee is adjourned. Yes, sir. Front of Jack Fields. Yeah. I know my boss. I know we talked to you. You're off on, on prenatal vaccines. The U.S. Senate gavel in shortly. They'll begin with about an hour of general speeches before considering a bill aimed at helping the caregivers of injured veterans. It would also expand veterans' health care in rural areas.